Good morning and welcome to the first meeting of the Criminal Justice Committee in 2024. We have no apologies this morning and our first item of business today is an evidence session on the work of the review into improving the management of sexual offences cases in Scotland. We're pleased to be joined today by Lady Dorian, the Lord Justice Clark and Senator of the College of Justice. And I refer members to papers one to three. Lady Dorian chaired the review which produced a report on improving the management of sexual offences cases and it's fair to say that the ideas in her report underpin many of the provisions of the Victims, Witnesses and Justice Reform Scotland Bill on which the committee is currently taking stage one evidence. So we're pleased that Lady Dorian is joining us this morning to speak about her report and I intend to allow up to 75 minutes for this session. So can I invite Lady Dorian to make a short opening statement? Thank you, uh, convener. The, the Lord President is grateful to the committee um, for accepting his offer that I come today to speak about the report uh, of the review group. As you know, members of the judiciary don't often attend Parliament to comment on the proposed legislation. And the fact that the Lord President has agreed that I should do so uh, I think shows the support of the judiciary for many of the reforms proposed in the bill, particularly those foreshadowed uh, in the review group report. Uh, improving the experience of victims and witnesses in the criminal justice system has been of primary importance to me since I became a judge. Both bo before and after I became Lord Justice Clark, I've either initiated or participated in a number of initiatives which have contributed to an improving picture. These include the practice notes which I hope the committee ha have been given, which I arranged to be sent yesterday. I thought it might be useful. These were designed, the 2017 one was designed to encourage greater use of commissions uh, and to give guidance about the issues which the court would expect to hear uh, submissions um, when uh, asked to grant an application. And the 2019 one was really aimed at getting written questions in advance where children were giving evidence um, and to simplify the, the process. The evidence and procedure report, um, that's a process that started in 2013, but the report in 2015 um, of the review um, was uh, uh, transformative, really. And I, I was a member of the steering group of that, chaired by Lord Carloway, um, which was calling for new ways of thinking to transform existing procedures rooted in the Victorian era. Uh, and it focused, as you know, on the benefits which would come from pre-recording the evidence of children and vulnerable witnesses and looking at what constitutes best evidence. That was followed up with the Next Steps report in 2016 to develop those uh, proposals. Uh, and a recommendation was made that all vulnerable witnesses should be able to give their evidence by pre-recording. There was uh, a a further report in 2017 making a large number of recommendations to enable wider use of uh, audiovisual recording. Um, and then, of course, the Act uh, in 2019 enshrined that for children in particular in the High Court, but giving scope for further development. All of these measures, then, these various measures, drove a more than 20-fold increase in the number of applications for commissions granted between 2017 and 2023, they went from 33 in 2017 to 750 in the year to November of 2023. And even in the year following the uh, 2017 practice note, there was a very substantial increase. This, I think, is the single most effective measure pre-recording whether it's done by commission or preferably at an earlier stage by um, pre-recording um, by police interview um, to enable the witnesses to give their uh, best evidence. The Sexual Offences Review Group followed on all of that, commissioned by the Lord President, and conducted a comprehensive cross-justice sector evidence-based exercise, producing the suite of recommendations with which I'm sure committee members are familiar, but designed to bring about a sea change in the management of sexual offences cases and focusing on what seemed necessary to improve the experience of complainers. 
without, of course, compromising the right to a fair trial. And as you pointed out, convener, uh, the, the report foreshadowed many of the provisions in the bill. It's worth pointing out that we found that despite reform stretching back 40 years to the first rape shield legislation, complainers were still, at the time of our report, reporting unsatisfactory experiences. And largely we felt that was partly anyway because that those reforms had taken place on a piecemeal basis, a bit here, a bit there, um, without focusing on how they fitted into the overall picture uh, of the prosecution of serious offences. The review group sought to review that by approaching it in a kind of holistic manner, making the six principal recommendations designed to develop a more complainer-centric system um, and to improve their experience significantly. So. Uh, with that introduction, I'm very happy to uh, try to answer uh, questions about my report. Th th thanks very much, Lady Dorian. That's a, a very helpful sort of opening overview of the back stop, if you like, the backdrop to the uh, to the review and just the the amount of work that that went on um, and has been going on for a number of years, as you say, to try and uh, and I'm interested in your quote to. Um, introduce new ways of thinking rooted in the Victorian uh, area. Um, I wonder if I can open up then with a, a, a general question um, about uh, the second recommendation in the report, which relates to the establishment of the Sexual Offences mm. Court. Yep. Uh, and it sets out uh, a, a wide range of key features, including uh, pre-recorded evidence, uh, judicial case management uh, and, and many others. And I'm interested in whether the review considered whether similar benefits um, might be achieved through specialism within existing court structures. Um, so looking at this from a, a practical perspective, in particular given the number of sexual offences cases that are reported to Crown Office is steadily increasing. We did, and one of the one of the reasons why we rejected it was the very point that you're making, which is the number of cases. Um, we 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 felt that given the increase that there has already been in these cases, and it's a continuing increase it, 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 year on year, these cases are increasing, and that increase is not, as far as I can see, going to stop. Um, and you know the the. the there are lots of reasons for that, and they're addressed to some extent in the report. Mm -hmm. uh, different ways of investigating by the police, um, the effect of numerous um, um, investigations going on elsewhere, and uh, inquiries which reveal, you know, uh, abuse, which then becomes a subject of prosecution. A whole raft of reasons. Our view was very firmly, and the the. I should say that the review group was unanimous on this. It wasn't unanimous on everything, but it was unanimous on this, that an approach was necessary which went beyond tinkering, uh, went beyond creating a little specialist group within the overall um, judiciary. Um, you'd need to do more than one anyway, because, you, you know... It, you could do a group in the High Court, but you wouldn't be touching on the issues of solemn prosecutions of of sexual offences in the Sheriff Court, which are also bound to be on the increase. Um, and <clears throat> we were concerned that the kind of piecemeal reforms that had taken place, which had been largely focused on the High Court, I suppose, but there had been others, hadn't actually achieved the overall improvements that we felt were necessary. Um, we recognised that there is a benefit, of course, in fitting the work in the hands of specialist judges. We can see that from other areas, mm -hmm. but they're smaller areas, you know, like the commercial court. Um, the, um, one of the big successes, I think, has been the focusing of um, work of preliminary hearings in the High Court in the hands of a small group of judges. And until that happened, the Bonhomie reform was never really rooted. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that, and that did have the effect. Um, but we felt quite strongly that simply creating another division of the High Court, for example, wouldn't achieve the necessary end. What was needed was a court of full national jurisdiction with the embedding of trauma-informed practices, 
common training of individuals across the court, uniformly applicable procedures, uh, which at the moment isn't the case, obviously, between the Sheriff Court and the Court of Session, uniformly applicable practice notes and directions, which again isn't the case because the High Court directions apply to the High Court. The Sheriff Court and the Sheriff Principals in each uh, Sheriffdom are responsible for issuing directions in, in the Sheriffdom. So with uniformly applicable procedures, expectations and case management, uniform, whether from Dumfries to Wick, uh, was what was required. We also felt, and this was really important given the huge increase in the number of cases, that a national court of this kind would also enable greater and more efficient use of the whole court estate across the country and the judiciary across the country. And that, we thought, was very important for a raft of reasons, for delivering local justice for individuals, for minimising the effect on uh, the, the judges who deal with these cases, because one of the issues was a concern about the, um, the knock-on effect of the sort of traumatisation of judges having to deal with a whole lot mm -hmm. of these cases, whereas if you, if you spread it more widely, that's less of a risk. Mm -hmm. And we we're also conscious of the fact that, so far as the High Court is concerned, um, we have been told uh, on more than one occasion by the Crown Office that, that there is uh, an increase coming our way, and I think we've already started to, to see it, of serious organised crime, uh, which will also be uh, a drain on the resources in the High Court. So uh, the idea... There, there were a number of factors really um, behind this, but the main issue was that um, it, it would be a court of national jurisdiction uniformly applicable uh, across the country. Okay. And I could go on. Yeah. I could go on at length about it, but uh, th th thank you. That's a, come up a, that's a question. helpful and, and comprehensive answer. I mean, I, th I, th I think one of the things um, I certainly. Um, have, have grappled with a little bit is around the practical application of a specialist court and uh, in a national context. And you've helpfully set out a lot of the benefits of the of this model, if you like. But did the review consider what the challenges around that that would be, and to, more from a practical application? Well, <clears throat> the challenges um, obviously the. The options, really, th there's not an option to do nothing. The options are either you embed this in a new culture, in a court that is of uniform practice across the country, or you try to embed it piecemeal in sheriffdoms and in, in the court of session. Mm -hmm. Either way, in the high court rather, either way, there's going to be an, a requirement for specialist training for judges, for staff, for clerks, for everyone. That's going to be necessary, however you do it. And we, we actually didn't think, I mean, you, you probably will get more detailed answers than this from SCTS, I think, but we were not of the view that there were going to be significant issues in relation to that, because one of the benefits would be that we would be able to have a greater use of the court estate. We'd have many more courts available for use by the Sexual Offences Court than are available at the moment, for example, in relation to the um, uh, the, the High Court. Uh, I think I've got figures somewhere, if you just uh, give me a moment. But um, the, the idea was that we would be able to do that. We'd be able to have a, a much greater use of the court estate and of the, um, the judiciary. I think one of the issues may be, um, if I can say so, is that to some extent, the provisions of the bill are quite complex mm -hmm. about the creation of the new court. And they seem to have been based on the creation of the Sheriff Appeal Court, which was a completely different model, a completely different animal. Um, and uh, I, so, for example, some of the structural requirements and concepts, including the possibility that the president of the new National Sexual Offences Court might be someone other than the Lord... Justice General or the Lord Justice Clerk seem to be overcomplicated and, if I may say so, counterproductive, especially given that it's the holders of these two offices that have driven all the reforms over the last 10 years. Um, another example is the 
process, complicated formal process for appointing and removal of judges. And I think we had in mind uh, that uh, a much more straightforward uh, amendment procedure of the 1995 Act could uh, achieve uh, the objective mm -hmm. without this somewhat cumbersome framework. Yeah. Okay, th th thank you, and I'm, I'm sure other members will have some more follow-up questions on, on, on the court model, if you like. Um, so I'm going to open um, questions up to members, and I'm firstly going to bring in John Swinney and then Sharon Dowie. It, thank you very much, Kavina. Uh, Lady Dorian, one of the remarks that you made just a moment ago um, I, I thought was of enormous significance, and I'd like to develop the thinking a bit further, is that you talked about this concept embedding a new culture. Yes. And I, I think for the benefit of the committee's understanding of the thinking that has underpinned your, uh, your work here, I think it would serve to, to hear just a little bit more about what... Because I, I, I think having listened to the evidence and other contents about this bill, that culture issue really resonates with me about the necessity of changing the dynamics and the nature of the process that is underway. And I think if I understand you correctly, you're saying to us, you can't really achieve that by tinkering with, for argument's sake, a Victorian set of procedures. Mm -hmm. yep. You need to go in, and I was struck by that from your, your report, on a blank sheet of paper basis. So I yep. think it would help us to understand the cultural point that you're making. In yes. That respect. Well, well, you're quite right that it is linked um, to the the point made in the report that piecemeal reforms don't achieve cultural change. Uh, I think that's <clears throat> abundantly clear. So, for example, in my report, we deal with the issues in relation to the um, rape shield legislation, which you know in, in, is now 40 years old. Since the, the first iteration of it is 40 years old, and it didn't work. Uh, it didn't work partly because of the way in which it was written. It didn't work partly because of the way it was interpreted. It was firmed up and revised. And it still didn't take hold sufficiently for the reasons that we address in the, the report. And I don't need to go into them, I don't suppose. But it was only with um, a concerted effort by the senior judiciary, the appeal court, in a number of cases to focus on what should be being done in relation to those that we actually got to the situation where we have really reached, a, a, we've gone past a tipping point. There are still instances of cases where something has not happened as it should, but they're much fewer than there were. So that has happened only after 40 years by you know, an enormous amount of effort because the culture wasn't changed at the outset. Uh, and that's only one area. There are a whole load of other ones that really require to be looked at. And it's one of the reasons why we're recommending that underpinning this all should be trauma-informed practice and training for everyone, because that's where you start changing the culture once people understand what this is all about. That's also why we think that it should be embedded in legislation, because that provides the legislative impetus towards creating this um, necessary culture change. That, that, that's very helpful uh, as an explanation. C can I ask you to reflect further on what is necessary about the cultural change to be undertaken or to be achieved to make this process effective? Because I, I, I think that the, the challenge that I would think would exist would be that Parliament may well be able to legislate for this, but it's then how does that become a meaningful change of practice? Now, one of the points you've made very powerfully is that judicial leadership has been crucial in taking us thus far. So what else is required to make sure that we, we can be in a position where 10 years down the track, we are looking back on this and seeing this as a, a significant moment in changing the experience of those who happen to be involved in uh, the work of the Sexual Offences Court? In, in large degree, that would be because of the training and um, educational requirements, um, which would be a necessity for the operation of the new court. Um, it, would, it would be operating according to trauma-informed practices. Its procedure would be developed 
in the light of trauma-informed practices, um, the whole idea in the report was designed to try to find ways of minimising uh, the um, trauma of giving evidence and going through the process as a complainer or witness in these kind of cases. And um, the, the idea that the cases would be in the hands of judges, court staff, who've all been trained thoroughly and in depth, assisted by prosecutors and defence lawyers who've similarly been trained um, to standards set by the Lord President, applying rules developed um, by reference to trauma and practice form practices should actually achieve that change of culture because everyone understands what, what's behind this and where we're going. So when we first started this um, journey, um, when we were trying to change um, and improve the number of commissions with the 2017, um, and actually also I think with the um, rape shield legislation, it was clear that practitioners hadn't come along as far as we had in the judiciary. And so they were not understanding why we were, we were doing what we were doing and why we were saying what we were saying. Uh, and that, that has substantially changed with better training from the point of view of the, the lawyers involved, both prosecution and defence. And I think that we are now at a stage where they do fully understand the position uh, about the rape shield legislation, why it operates as it does, and why it should operate that way. Uh, and the same thing, I think, has happened in relation to commissions following on the 2017, um, the 2017 practice note. Until that point, um, the, the, the lawyers were not always... And it, Often it's the Crown who make the application for the witness to give their evidence by special measures or by commission. Usually it will be. But there was a lack of thought about what, what is it that are the requirements of this witness? What are their communication requirements? What are they afraid of? What can be do to make that process easier for them? And all of those things were addressed in the, the, the practice note. Now, if you start from common base where everyone understands that, you've got a much better chance of changing the culture. Thank you for that. Uh, and the last question I have, Kavir, is just on the, one of the issues that we've um, discussed in previous sessions of the committee has been um, the, the role of questioning witnesses, the role of defence counsel, particularly sometimes it may, may well also be the um, uh, the position of uh, you know, the, the actions of the Crown as to whether or not that is conducted in a fashion that is compatible with the legitimate aspirations which I entirely endorse about trauma-informed practice. And I suppose one of the, the lines of argument that's been put forward to us is that, well, you know, we've got to be satisfied that the right questions have been asked in the right fashion to ensure a fair trial is being delivered. Now, I, I, I'm all for, you know, I obviously want fair trials to be undertaken, but I am concerned that trauma-informed practice might be disregarded in the name of ensuring a fair trial is being undertaken, and particularly in relation to the conduct of defence counsel and defence agents. And I'm just interested in your observations about what the court can do and what yep. the judiciary can do can, to make sure that, yes, we have fair trials, but also we have fair trials conducted in a fashion that are not damaging to witnesses that are coming forward in good faith. Well, I, I think that there's very little risk that the trauma-informed practices would be set aside or ignored in the way that you're suggesting. Um, the, the, we've already had a lot of judicial training on that so that judges, all judges in the High Court and all temporary uh, judges in the High Court have had trauma-informed training. That training has been developed exponentially, really, as we've gone on, so it's been improved and, uh, and so on, and we're, we've got more um, courses coming up um, to uh, improve the situation. And the, the, both the Lord President and I could not have made it any plainer what the responsibilities of judges are and what is expected of the lawyers in a series of cases. Uh, and uh, it, it's, I have to say it's, it's working, but it's working because we have been 
insistent on it over a period of time, and the other judges have also accepted and adopted that culture. Uh, and um, of course, no system's 100% um, foolproof, but the matters that used to cause concern and were the cause of concern at the time of um, this report uh, have improved really enormously. Um, judges are much more interventionist um, than they used to be, but also the lawyers are behaving better generally. I mean, there are pockets um, of, of um, instances of bad practice, but we're aware of that and we're dealing with it. I have, for example, um, asked all judges um, some time ago to bring to my notice any egregious examples of bad practice that they encounter uh, so that I can take them up with the law society or with the dean according to what might be necessary, and I'd have absolutely no hesitation in doing that. Um, have you, have you, have, has it been required for you to do so? It mm. has not been required for me to do so recently. I have in the past had occasion to do so, but in, in the last year, I would say, I have not had occasion to do so. I asked yesterday for some figures to be given to me about um, appeals from preliminary hearings, because the rape shield legislation is dealt with at the preliminary hearing usually, in 90-odd, 97% of cases or something. And if... Um, if the parties, either the Crown or the Defence, are not happy with that, they can seek leave to appeal uh, and have the High Court deal with it on appeal. There's a very quick process for those appeals. And until about 2020, we had a fair number of appeals which were to do with dissatisfaction with the way the judge had decided the rape shield legislation. Usually the defence saying the judge was wrong not to allow uh, questioning, but occasionally there was a Crown appeal. Um, and uh, I, I've not been able to get very detailed figures, and I just asked them to look at a couple of years, but um, it was my impression, and this confirms it, that those kind of appeals have reduced it quite substantially. So from 2020 to 2021, 63% of appeals from preliminary hearings related to dissatisfaction with rape shield legislation. In 21 to 22, that went down to 43%. Uh, and I strongly suspect that it will be even less then, which, to my mind, shows that control is being exercised by the judiciary, but also that the profession is now accepting that and understands the position. And I think that um, perhaps conforms with evidence I read that the committee had received from Stuart Munro um, when uh, giving evidence in an earlier session. Thank you, Kavir. Thank you. Um, we've got quite a bit to get through. That's half an hour in already. So if I can maybe um, politely ask for fairly succinct answers, Lady Dorian. Um, so I'm going to bring in Sharon Dowie and then Rona Mackay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the review group concluded that a specialist sexual offences court should be set up which adopts the routine pre-recording of complainers' evidence and uses trauma-informed practice. Um, and you mentioned earlier on about how there was a requirement for specialist training, however we done it. So with the bill obliging all courts to comply with trauma-informed practice, is there a need for a new court to be set up? Well, I think I've really answered that question yeah. um, at, when, when the convener asked me about um, this. It, it, it's really... That, that is only one part of it. You need, to, you need to make sure that you have a whole court that adopts this and doing it across the country. The rape shield legislation, for example, that applies to all the courts across the country, has always done by virtue of the, of the um, legislation. But it hasn't embedded a practice. Um, and this is, it's only, this is only one part of embedding the practice. It's helped, it's a way of helping to change the culture, but it's only the start, uh, and much more is needed. Okay, thanks. In the review, when you recommended setting up a special sexual offences court, did you envisage a new purpose-built court for this, or do you think it can be done in the current estate? I had no conception of there being a new purpose-built court. My idea throughout was that we would be able to utilise, to a much greater extent, all of the resources across the Crown, uh, across the estate, um, and that we would be able to... Um, 
uh, spread those cases so that they could be dealt with more locally. Uh, local justice is quite an important issue. Um, uh, and I had no had no I no notion that we would be looking at a new uh, court building. That would be completely unnecessary in my view. Right. So is that what you meant? It said we'd have access to a much wider pool of venues than currently available to the High Court. That was just using all of the courts that were available to. Yes. That's fine. Thank you. Um, can I ask the review recommended that the Sexual Offences Court should have sentencing powers up to ten years imprisonment. What was the basis? for the limit, considering there is no limit on the length of prison sentence when someone is convicted of rape in the High Court? Well, we've given an explanation for that mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the report in some detail. Uh, basically, th that was based on what our understanding of sentencing practice in the High Court is. A vast majority of cases do not end in sentences of more than 10 years. We were recommending that um, cases where, which were likely to be to result in a life sentence or in actually more likely an OLR, they can be identified in advance and we, we dealt with uh, either in the sexual offences court by a judge of the high court who would then be able to deal with it uh, uh, to give a higher sentence or to remit to the high court. That's a very familiar um, practice, you know, that... Um, Set for, set in sentencing that uh, the sheriff, for example, could remit to the High Court for sentencing in a case where they think that their powers are inadequate. OK, thanks. Just like, do you anticipate further delays in the judicial system with the setting up of the court? Do you think it will add delays to the process? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think it should have the opposite effect, I would hope. But, uh, yeah. Right, OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rona Mackay, followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, convener. Good, good morning, Lady Dorian. Um, I wanted to ask you about rape trial pilots. Um, and in your report, you say that the review group was divided on this. Yep. Um, and the report recommends that consideration should be given to developing a time-limited uh, pilot of rape trials without juries. Could you maybe expand a bit on that and what level of support was there within the review group for, for a pilot of that nature? Well, the, the, the group was divided. I think it's fair to say it was reasonably easy, evenly divided. Um, I, I, I don't have the exact figures of, of how the division went, but my recollection is it was relatively evenly divided. Um, and the, the rationale behind the recommendation was that um, the real benefit would be we would then have evidence of what happens in a judge-only trial, and we'd be able to compare that with... Uh, what happens in jury trials. We'd be able to uh, compare the experience of a complainer in one compared with the other. We can't do that. Um, we'd be able to compare the outcome. We'd be able to compare how the questioning was handled. We'd be able to compare how long the trial took. We'd be able to compare all of these things. Um, at the moment, it's all speculation because we, we have nothing to compare it with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Um, so... Would this be take into account the, the evidence related to rape myths? And, and would, would that be part of the consideration for um, perhaps having... That was one trials? of the underlying reasons for considering that it, was, it would be a, a, a benefit mm -hmm. um, because uh, we went into some detail about the issue of rape myths and uh, I won't give you the uh, details. Um, 534 and 540 to 42 are the relevant relevant paragraphs in the report. Um, but judges are not going to be affected by those, and so that would definitely be a difference. Um, and given that we now instruct juries about rape myths, we'd then be able to compare and see whether those who said it's not necessary, it's, it'll be enough just to give juries better instruction on this, mm -hmm. we'd be able to see whether they were right. So you say time limited. Do you have any indication of what, what time scale that would be? Just I, I had in mind myself something of a couple of years, probably something like that, to to yeah. to obtain sufficient material. But um, you know that's something that I think would have to be considered sure. carefully. And do you know of any other jurisdictions where this is happening? 
um, juryless trials? Or? Um, I think that there was uh, some reference in this to it having been tried in, in a number of jurisdictions or, or, or going to be tried. I think New Zealand was one. Um, and uh, there had... Um, they, maybe New Zealand... Maybe New Zealand was actually thinking about doing it. I think maybe South Africa had tried it. Um, but I, it's in the report. I'm sorry, I can't recall the mm -hmm. international mm -hmm. evidence. Yeah. So just um, on the re review group's kind of division on it, um, would you say, and I'm, I'm obviously not asking for, for figures, but the majority would be in favour of this? or uh, I couldn't say. I, I, all I can say is they were divided. There was no majority, otherwise there would have been a yeah. majority of you put across. Mm -hmm. They were divided uh, in general terms, uh, and that's all I can say. There were, there were some who were vocally strongly against, there were some who were strongly in favour, there were others who could see a more nuanced way of looking at it, um, there were others who thought there might be some benefit in some elements and not in others. It, it, it's impossible to uh, mm -hmm. say other than that. It mm -hmm. is an issue upon which the uh, review group was unable to reach a concluded view. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Um, Pauline McNeil. Thank you. Good morning. Um, First of all, I'd um, like to commend um, you on the work that you've done and the way you've presented this to the committee. Um, Thank you. It's clear that there is a need for change, so um, I I'm absolutely clear about that. I once wanted to give some context to my question. So it's really about... So you've made the case for a specialist court, but what I'm interested in is where does it then sit in the hierarchy? Excuse my terminology, but that's the way I see it as a layperson. So I'm interested in what the status of the specialist court would be and if you thought that the legislation as drafted really high, really reflected what you had intended in your report, for example, it, the report says that the rights of audience in the sexual offences court should be limited to advocates and solicitor advocates, but it's not reflected in the legislation. Now, <clears throat> I can go as far back as the reforms that, because I did chair the committee at the time when Lord Bornemy not only um, did the report on the preliminary hearings, but also extended the sentencing powers of sheriff courts. But it stuck in my mind, and I think there's a parallel here for me, mm. that when he proposed the extension of the sentencing powers for sheriff courts to five years, he was clear that there should still be the allowance of sanctioning of counsel for serious cases. Now, you'll know it's very, very rare now for counsel to be sanctioned in the share of court. So my concern about the creation of the specialist court, which I think is a very good case for, is that in the creation of it, if the rights of audience changes, so solicitors can now, uh, under the legislation, represent an accused person, I don't think for rape or murder, but for a serious sexual offence. Um, so I wondered if you could speak to any concerns that you might have about whether the legislation reflects what, what seems to me to be a report to maintain a high status of the court, and how do you see the status of the specialist court in relation to the high court? Well, I, I've already said that I don't think that the legislation does reflect what mm -hmm. I, I had in mind. Um, uh, it, it seems to be trying to create some kind of new, different structure uh, as opposed to fit the, what I had in mind into the structure. Uh, and what I had in mind w was effectively a parallel court in a sense but with the Lord President or Lord Justice General as the head of it, the Lord Justice Clark as the deputy head of it, just as generally across the court system is the case, um, uh, um, use, being able to use all of the, the court estate and all of the judicial resources uh, as and how necessary, as long as properly trained and everything else in place. And we recommended... Uh, as you picked up, that um, it should be the equivalent of the rights of audience in the High Court um, because we wanted to make sure that the importance of this was understood, that these are serious matters that should be dealt with at a particular level, and that really was the reason why we said that uh, rights of audience should be solicitor advocates with extended rights or 
um, advocates. That's it's in the report. The justification is there. Thank you very much. Um, so, if the legislation were passed, so the rights of audience would, would change, that would include sheriffs would be sitting in the specialist court, which they can't in the High Court at the moment. I mean, well, sheriffs you... do sit in the High Court at the moment as, te as temporary, uh, temporary, uh, temporary yeah. uh, judges. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very significant number of them who do, uh, mm -hmm. and they do a very good job indeed. Thank you. Um, um, so that wouldn't be the issue, but the issue is uh -huh. the issue is those appearing who are doing the questioning of the witnesses yeah. uh, and the cross examination of the witnesses. Um, those are the ones that we were concerned about, and we wanted to make sure that they had gone through the additional training that is necessary to obtain. And that's not I'm not now talking about the trauma informed practices only. I'm talking about additional training in court craft. Um, an additional training in court processes, procedures and behaviour that you get if you uh, become an advocate or get extended rights of audience. So my final question is related to that. I mean, the, the, there have been many discussions in this parliament about how we tackle the crime of rape, which seems to be a low conviction rate for. Um, if the specialist court, the sexual offences court, looks as if it doesn't have the same status as the high court, so it, so if it doesn't have the rights of audience for the, I mean, I'm I'm assuming that the reason it's drafted that way, designed that way, is to reflect the seriousness of crime and the importance of the status of rape as a serious crime, as a plea to the crown, which can only be tried in the high court. Would you have concerns if? the legislation doesn't reflect your recommendations or rights of audience, it's going to look like a lower court. We, we made it very clear um, that um, one of the drivers for the, the main driver for this whole idea was to improve the, the experience of complainers and that the way to do that was a specialist court properly, properly um, set up, properly uh, with proper training and with um, serious rights of audience of those who can appear in it. And this was specifically to make it clear that we were not uh, in any way diminishing the importance of these cases, and quite the reverse. And I, can I just refer you to paragraphs 341 and 342 of the report where this issue is dealt with? Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, Russell Finlay, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Good um, morning. I've got a few questions. The first one is about uh, juryless trials. Um, your review group consists of all the key players in the Scottish justice system, but they couldn't reach a consensus on this, as you've already told us. And it's perhaps the single most contentious part of the bill. And I'd be interested to know what your own position is on that. Well... I, I, I took the view that this was something worth looking at. That was my position, simply that it's something worth looking at. It's worth examining, it's worth having a, a, a pilot, because, as I've already said, then we would have the evidence. I, I have not, and the review uh, group considering this was not looking at this as a long-term plan at this stage at all. It was looking at this being an evidence-gathering exercise to enable us to address the issue properly and with a, an evidential base. I mean, all our report was based on evidence, and this is a, an important area, and we, we don't really have the evidence to be able to compare whether a complainer would have a better experience with a judge alone trial or with a jury trial. Did, did the review group foresee the reaction that would have come, that has come from many in the legal profession? and? and this is perhaps straying into the bill and what happens next, but if practitioners, uh, as they threaten to do, do not participate, how could that then happen? Well, that's a matter that is, uh, with respect, um, for you to grapple with and not so much for me. But um, on the first part of that question, the answer is yes, obviously, because as I've already explained um, it to, I think it was to Ms Mackay, that, that the... The, um, there were some who were very vocal uh, against it, and there were others who were fairly vocal in, in favour of it. Um, so that there was definitely a, 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 a dichotomy there that was very obvious and clearly would be carried through into the wider 
world. In respect of the Sexual Offences Court proposal, um, some people have already asked about who can practice there and so on. Um, but one issue is um, the bill extending the court's proposed remit to other crimes, including murder, for example. Um, the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service say that this could result in much greater cost than what's suggested in the financial memorandum. D do you think, on the basis of your review, that the court should deal only with crimes of a sexual nature? Uh, I, I, I think it's, it's difficult to go quite that far. But what we did say was that um, crimes such as murder should be tried in the High Court, continue to be tried in the High Court, even if there is a sexual offence along with them. Um, I don't think one could go as far as saying it should only deal with sexual offences, because frequently, just to give an example, you might have a dozen charges on an indictment, ten of them might be um, sexual offences, one of them might be a breach of the peace, one of them might be a drugs offence. So uh, it's not practical to suggest that they could, shouldn't... Um, have uh, jurisdiction over other uh, crimes, but it, it's it's in the report in, um, on the question of jurisdiction at three thirty six. Okay, thank you. Um, now, your view also recommends that complainers should have access to legal representation yep. in the event of a section two seven five application. But concerns about how this would work have been raised by very many people: Crown Office, Scottish Courts Tribunal Service, Law Society, and even your senior judicial colleagues, and in their submission to the committee, the judges say this measure, and I quote, will create a considerable, considerable amount of extra work and, again quoting, considerable potential for delay and churn. Now, the Crown and SCTS submission uh, to the committee also used that word churn, and the Law Society also cite a risk of potential extra cost. So, on the basis of these concerns, did the review group perhaps not give adequate consideration to the potential unforeseen consequences that are now being warned about? Well, to, to some extent, I think that the, um, the so-called unforeseen consequences are a result of Section 64 in the, uh, the bill and the way in which it's envisaged that this should operate. Um, it seems, on the face of it, somewhat cumbersome, time-consuming and... Um, and a procedure of that kind may may have the kind of consequences that, that you're talking about. I, I would have thought that a much simpler procedure could be developed. Because in the Crown's submission to us, it was four, pa four pages of that related directly to the practicalities of dealing with seven, 275 issues and legal representation. So, in essence, you're supportive of it, but take the view that the bill could be amended potentially or streamlined. I, I, th I think a more streamlined way of dealing with this could be could be found um, is my own view of it um, but I'm very strongly supportive of the uh, proposal for independent legal representation uh, I, I, I in fact I think that there's an unanswerable case for independent legal representation uh, given the experience of complainers, given the experience that we have had over the years where the Crown have not objected to Section 275 applications when it was blatantly clear that every single paragraph of the application should have been objected to and should have been refused. Uh, and um, so there have been a number of cases of that kind uh, and it's, it's quite clear that sometimes not only has that happened where the Crown have not... Um, um, represented the complainer's interests in that way, um, there can be a conflict between the interests of the complainer and the interests of the Crown as the prosecutor. Uh, and there are all sorts of other reasons, and they're all dealt with in detail in the report. But, but even, even if the proposed legislation is, is fixed and streamlined, surely by the very nature of an additional voice in the court, there's going to result in more delay, potentially. I, 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 don't, really, I don't really think that's necessarily the case. The, the, the um, 275 applications are dealt with at, at preliminary hearings. As long as the notice period is sufficient to enable that still to be done, then there's no reason why they can't continue to be dealt with at the preliminary hearing. It's one hearing, yeah. uh, and it takes place anyway as part of the process at combined ground rules and procedural hearing. It takes place 
um, there would be an additional voice. A lot of the stuff is dealt with in, in writing anyway, because detailed, um, a detailed um, application has to be made, and very often um, parties will submit a written note of what their views are on this, uh, and the court will then determine it. So, um, and, and there is, at the moment, the scope for an appeal... Um, I've already given you the figures about them. There were about, um, I think, about 11 last year, uh, 22 years ago. Uh, and um, they're not all, of course, on Section 274, but um, a significant proportion of them would be. It's a small number. In allowing the right of appeal to the complainer as well wouldn't really, uh, shouldn't really have that um, major effect. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fulton McGregor, followed by Katie Clark. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Good uh, morning, uh, yes. uh, Lady Doreen. Um, I, I was actually going to ask about independent legal representation as well, but Russell Finlay was in there before me. But I, I, there is, that's still an area I would like to ask about. And I think one of the things that we um, we heard that was quite uh, concerning, it goes back to actually John Swinney's point, is some of the evidence we've heard around how um, victim and witness Victims and witnesses have, or complainers, should I say, have failed during the trial, particularly the cross-examination, and that's around um, the particular practice of bringing up their character or perhaps sexual history. Now, is, is, the, is the element of legal representation really based around that, to protect people around that particular... Um, that, that's, that that's, on, that's only what it's for. Yeah, OK. So, I, I, personally speaking, um, I, I, I think um, independent legal representation is a really good idea. I, I welcome it in your report and welcome it in the, uh, in the bill. But going back to what Russell Finlay said there, if it's not workable for whatever reason, um, you know, is there another way then to deal with that issue of perhaps when defence lawyers bring out these particular um, these particular issues um, around characters and sexual history as part of their defence. Is there another way that the group looked at that could, that could perhaps be addressed? The only other way of doing it is the way that has failed. Yeah. Is there any way to strengthen the current arrangement to make sure that it doesn't well, fail? Well, the court has been trying to do that. Um, the court has been trying to do that by um, requiring the um, the Crown um, to confirm that they have obtained, they've notified the complainer, they have sought the views of the complainer, uh, and uh, so on. Um, um, and so the court has been trying uh, to do that um, because... Um, it was clear that it wasn't happening. It was meant to be happening, though, so before that. It was meant to be happening. It just mm -hmm. wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we discovered in uh, an appeal, uh, it was um, a, another case, when we discovered it wasn't happening, um, we changed the um, pr pr preliminary hearing um, uh, at sheet where they have, they have to provide all the information to the court beforehand. We changed the sheet to make sure that um, the uh, Crown confirmed in writing that the complainer had been told of the content of a 275 application, had been invited to comment on the accuracy of any allegations within it, had been asked to state any objections which the complainer might have to grant in the application, and that then those were would be put forward to the court uh, when the application was dealt with. Now, um, our, our view of it, and this was the unanimous view of the, um, the review group, was that independent legal representation was the best way of doing this. Um, if the committee feels otherwise, then steps would have to be very clearly set out, identifying what the obligation on the Crown was and, and what would happen if they, if they failed in that obligation. Thank you. I think you've made a very compelling case there about how you, how the review group and yourself came to that decision. No Thank you. Thanks. Katie Clark. Uh, 
review consider whether complainers might be provided with independent legal representation in a wider range of circumstances? I mean, you may well be aware that in other jurisdictions in recent decades, they've brought in um, legal representation in some cases throughout the process. Is that something that the review group looked at or indeed you've given any thought to? We, we did look at this. Um, we thought that independent legal representation in relation to Section 274 mm -hmm. was the critical thing. And in making that, we were also conscious of the fact that where there is, for example, an application for recovery of medical records, that's a separate process. Mm -hmm. And there is already... Um, ability for a complainer to enter that process and to oppose the recovery of medical records, psychiatric records, or anything like that. Um, and so we we felt that the limit of what should happen within the criminal trial was independent legal representation at the Section 275 stage. Anything else was likely to derail the trial, cause additional delay, put out time limits and everything else, all the concerns that Mr Finlay and Mr McGregor have been voicing already this morning. Have you looked at other jurisdictions or was that not something that you looked at in any detail and whether some of those consequences have taken place in, in other countries where they have brought it in? We're aware that um, there is uh, one jurisdiction in the UK where um, there is independent legal representation, namely in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, I can't. Uh, I don't think that we were able to look at what the consequences of that had been. Um, um, possibly it hadn't been in place for long enough. I can't. I can't recall. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's um, it's addressed in our um, our report. Mm -hmm. I mean, because one of the the major concerns, as you know, sorry, apologies. I, I, th I thought it was available in Northern Ireland. It's been re it had been recommended. Yes. It's available in Southern Ireland. I apologise. Yes. Four four forty three of yes. the report. I, I mean, it, it's something that happens in in many parts of Europe and indeed in parts of South America and, and other jurisdictions. But I, I, I don't think you may one can make looked... I don't think one can make those comparisons because that... they, those are not systems where they operate the same kind of legal system. They're a system where there is a party civil, for example, uh, involved in mm -hmm. criminal proceedings throughout so it's an entirely different kind of uh, provision mm -hmm. i don't think one can make that comparison the, the proper comparison is with what are common law jurisdictions um and ireland is one and northern ireland is one mm -hmm. so i mean as you know one of the concerns that's raised repeatedly by um survivors and by victims organizations is the the lack of power and information mm. that many rape victims in particular feel throughout the process, mm. not just during the court process, but from the very, very early And we stages. did make rec recommendations mm -hmm. about that. We made detailed mm -hmm. recommendations about improving the quality of the information given to complainers, mm -hmm. improving the quality of the communication. We made a recommendation for um, a one-stop shop, as it were, you know, mm -hmm. single point of contact. Um, mm -hmm. Um, for that, because we recognised um, the mm -hmm. validity of the point that you're making. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. John Swinney. Can I just follow up that point, Lady Dorian, that Katie Clark has raised with you about that flow of information, because it takes mm. me on to the, 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 the issue, one of the issues that I, I'd like to raise with you, which is <coughs> you, you chaired a review group, which was a, a whole system review group, recognising there are whole system issues involved in this. And I just wonder if you could share with the committee what else you think needs to be improved to get to a position where we might look back on these reforms and think this has been a, a seminal moment in improving the, you know, the experience of um, uh, complainers and to ensure that the process operates in a more timely fashion given the premium you've attached to evidence being gathered in a timely fashion so that recollections are able to be tested in the most effective way and at the strongest moment in, their, uh, in the experience that individuals have? Well, I think we spent quite a lot of time in the report talking about the communication issue and talking about the experience that uh, complainers uh, had uh, of... Um, of feeling that they weren't being listened to 
feeling that they didn't have someone they could contact who could give them adequate and accurate information. Uh, and um, that's, you know, notwithstanding the 2014 Act. Um, and we, we've we noted quite a lot of uh, information about that in the first chapter of the report, specifying the kind of information that we think should be given to complainers, that it should be through uh, a, a single point of contact. It was suggested to us on a, a number of occasions that it, that was extremely difficult to achieve, but we couldn't see why that would be the case uh, as long as there was someone in each... or Because the idea was that different organisations are involved in this... Um, but there's no reason why they couldn't all have a single point of contact working together with one additional one who was the point of contact for the complainer. So uh, I think that's one of the uh, issues. Delay at various stages, we addressed that, both at the stage of the investigation, uh, at the stage when it gets into the hands of the Crown, uh, and then uh, at the stage when it's in court. And we made recommendations there, and I think quite a few of those have been acted on by the police and by, by the Crown, and the court has certainly acted uh, upon them. Um, the other things, um, the pre-recording of evidence at a much earlier stage, that, that, that is the key thing, a much earlier stage. Uh, and even at the time of the EPR, our, our thinking was the evidence in chief should effectively be the first interview with the police. Uh, it should be by a skilled interviewer. And given that police now wear, you know, or are going to be wearing body cameras and that's being rolled out, that's how the evidence should be captured at the beginning. And that would enable uh, a much more likely, uh, give a much more likely chance of any additional commissions or cross-examination being able to take place at a much earlier stage as well. And th that was key to the evidence and procedure review. Uh, the other things were that if, um, on the assumption that we continued with juries, we made a, a, a whole raft of recommendations about the changes that should be made in relation to um, how juries are um, instructed, directed, and so on. Uh, and um, we haven't uh, had to wait for legislation to introduce those. We've introduced every single one of them. Right. Thank you for that. And the last question I've got is really on you know, part of the, 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 you know, the issue that we've long debated about the um, uh, successful or unsuccessful prosecution of sexual crimes yeah. has been about quality of evidence. And I, I, I'm interested to know your thoughts on whether... Any of the ref do you consider that the suggestions that you are making are there any dangers that in any way they lead to um, a reduction in the quality of evidence that is available? You know, is there a sense that evidence by commission is not as sturdy as evidence that's gathered in some other fashion? No, I I've heard that canard uh, on a number of occasions, uh, and it's just incorrect. Um, the, 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 and there is evidence. There is evidence. We refer to it in the, the report. There is evidence to, to, to show that it's incorrect. We in Scotland have the best evidence possible to show it's incorrect because for three years we operated trials where juries saw no live witnesses at all. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and the conviction rates over that period were really not in any way un uncomparable to the conviction rates prior to that period. So... You know, for three years, the jury didn't see a single live witness. All they saw was the witnesses on the screen. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is this, and it's dealt with quite in quite a lot of detail in the in the report, I think. Our experience of commissions is that the evidence is much more focused. Uh, it's mu it takes it's compressed because a whole because there's no jury and a whole lot of you know, repetitive questions that are being made for the benefit of the jury. And I'm not criticising that as a practice. Sometimes it's necessary. But that happens a lot less. There is a much greater focus on what needs to be asked of the witness and what does not need to be asked of the witness. And the, um, the length of time that the commission takes, I think at the time of the report, people's experience was it was about half the time that it took for the witness to give evidence in court uh, I think it's probably a lot less than that now. 
um, it probably c c is down to something a, a matter of hours compared to a matter of days that it might be for a witness to give evidence. Of course, there are complicated cases where, which are slightly different, but you know that has to be borne in mind as well. That the the, the the nature of the evidence that is taken on commission is done in a much clearer, uh, much more focused way than is generally done at trial, and that too is a, a benefit. And that strikes me as being absolutely consistent with the aspiration about trauma and from practice of absolutely. minimising the, experience, the, the negative experience for a witness. Absolutely. It's key to it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just watching the time, Lady Dorian, if I may just come in with a couple of um, yes. final questions. Um, just I think it was in response to some questions from Russell Finlay around the um, rape trial pilot. Um, you used the phrase evidence gathering in terms of the sort of purpose and the objective of the, 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 the pilot. I was just interested in whether or not the review considered if there may be any influence or risk that the pilot could perhaps impact um, or influence the outcome of a case at all, just by virtue of the fact that, that a case was being heard as part of a pilot. Um, and also perhaps whether the issue around an accused, or if they were convicted, may have, again by virtue of their case being heard as part of a pilot, may have a right of appeal. I'm just interested in the, if the review considered those points. Um, I, in relation to the first point, I don't think that there is any risk of that. The, mm -hmm. These pilots would be presided over by experienced uh, mm -hmm. professional judges mm -hmm. uh, and uh, who would uh, decide the case according to the evidence, only according to the evidence. We're quite used to having pilots of one kind or another, um, uh, which don't seem to have caused problems in the past, yeah. piloting drug courts, piloting other kinds of courts. Um, and as far as the appeal is concerned, there is one um, big advantage of uh, judge alone trials, and that is that there is an obligation to give reasons. Uh, and so um, the reasons are there. Um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that that would result in more uh, rather than fewer mm -hmm. appeals. Th th thank you, that's helpful. And my final question, I, th I know Pauline McNeil is wanting to come in, I'll just ask my final question, um, is on um, the issue of anonymity of victims. Yeah. Um, and again, your report recommended express legislative protection yep. um, for the anonymity of victims of sexual offences. So I'm interested in what were the reasons for this recommendation and what, what difference do you think that protection would, would afford victims? Well, it would give them a degree of comfort for a start because they would know that it was clearly set out in legislation that they had anonymity. Uh, it would reflect the position in other jurisdictions where it's set out in statute. Um, there is actually, at the moment, there is no statutory protection. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all based on common law and it's all based on, a, effectively, a gentleman's agreement with the press. And um, the mainstream press have shown themselves to be trustworthy in that respect mm -hmm. uh, and to be able to um, abide by the convention that they do not identify complainers. But we don't live in an area, a, a, a time, when the mainstream press is the only source of reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we have um, now to deal with blogging, social media... Citizen journalists, um, I think they call themselves, uh, and um, you know, and also there is a there is a trend uh, seems to be developing um, towards reporting trials by proper reporters reporting them in a um, uh, in a podcast mm -hmm. as the trial goes on, and mm -hmm. and um, there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, again, it's a different way of presenting the material to the public mm -hmm. uh, and really in order to provide a real safeguard uh, against the risk of inadvertent disclosure by uh, a professional or a mischievous disclosure by mm -hmm. a non-professional we felt that it should be made um, clear in statute 
Th thank you, Lady Dorian. And I'll finally bring in Pauline McNeill. Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, Lady Dorian, I put this question to the senators when they come, but just as the convener asked the question about the jurylist trials. Um, so, so am I right in saying that normally in a trial, well, the jury would decide the evidence they believed, but the judge would decide the law on it? Would, does that mean that in a jurylist trial, then the judge would be deciding both well, the evidence as well. And does that mean there's any different process for a judge to go through in a jurylist trial because they wouldn't normally decide the evidence? Um, that would be the jury that would make those decisions? No, not really. I mean, uh, every day in the sheriff court, judges are making decisions on both the facts and the law mm -hmm. um, when they sit um, as a sheriff without a jury and decide criminal cases. So they're doing it all the time. Um, and judges are also used to dealing with quite complex legal and factual cases in civil matters where they are responsible for making the decision themselves. And in fact, over the last few years, we've had a number of cases where the allegation in the civil case is one of rape uh, and the judge has, uh, has not had any difficulty in dealing with the matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm just going to squeeze one final question in from Thanks. very quickly. It's a very quick one. It's to do with the proposed sexual offences court. Um, you said earlier in your evidence that you didn't think tinkering would be sufficient. However, the submission to the committee from the fact of Faculty of Advocates is quite robust in saying that through existing mechanisms, I quote, there's no single feature of the proposed court which could not be delivered rapidly. I just wonder whether you could give me your views on that particular view they have expressed? Well, the, um, we have, of course, managed to um, bring in the uh, changes of um, the way in which juries are directed and so on. Um, but whether you bring them in rapidly or not, they're still being done in a piecemeal way. They're not being done in a principled way with the underpinning of uh, an, a, a whole court dedicated to um, um, you know, trauma-informed practices. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the things that we said in the report was, if we, if, we, if we don't seize the opportunity really to create what Mr Swinney's been talking about as the culture change and create that from the ground upwards, there is every risk that in 40 years' time, my successor, your successors, are going to be in this room having the same conversation. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you very much indeed, uh, Lady Dorian. We appreciate your time this morning uh, and coming and joining us. So we'll now take a short suspension. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Our next item of business is to consider it's to continue, I beg your pardon, with our stage one evidence taking on the Victims, Witnesses and Justice Reform Scotland Bill. So today we're starting phase three of our scrutiny of the bill, focusing specifically on parts five and six of the bill. And this covers the establishment of a new sexual offences court, anonymity for victims of sex offences, independent legal representation for complainers, and the proposal for a pilot for judge-led trials in certain rape cases. So this morning we're joined with, by uh, the Right Honourable Dorothy Bain, uh, KC, the Lord Advocate. So welcome. And I refer members to papers one to three, and I intend to allow around about 75 minutes for this session. So I wonder if I can um, begin with an opening uh, question, uh, Lord Advocate. Um, in the uh, Crown Office submission, um, it expressed uh, su support for the creation of a sexual uh, offences court, a specialist uh, court. Um, however, the submission did detail some concerns in and around the practical application of such a court. So can I ask what are your reasons for supporting the idea uh, of a specialist court and perhaps just to maybe expand on some of the concerns that were raised? So I think it's clear from the submission that the Crown is fully supportive of the creation of a specialist sexual offences court. And that's because of an identification of the need to transform the way in which sexual crime is prosecuted in Scotland. And uh, it will require a determined effort by all of those within the criminal justice system to accept that there's need, of, need for change mm -hmm. and to engage in a radical rethink of what the rule of law requires. And so, for the Crown, the introduction of the proposed Specialist Sexual Offences Court would play a critically important part in the development of the type of change that is required. Mm -hmm. I just heard the Lord Justice Clark speak about why the need for the Specialist Court was so profound, and I agree with her on that. I think underpinning all of this is the fact that sexual violence against women and girls is now recognised as a worldwide endemic problem and the World Health Organization and the United Nations have identified violence against women as a global problem of pandemic proportions and statistics uh, produced in 2021 estimated that in one in three women worldwide they've experienced either physical or sexual intimate partner violence or non-partner violence and sexual violence in their lifetime. So the identification of intimate partner violence is one that is very troubling mm -hmm. in terms of these statistics. So that's a background, but it's also become recognised across the profession that effective prosecution of sexual crime requires specialisation and the needs of complainers require the most careful consideration and provision of effective support. So. I consider that the proposed court reforms offer the opportunity for a complete rethink and redesign of the court process in order for the court to deliver for both complainers and indeed the accused to appear in it. So the creation of a new court with new procedures and practices presents an opportunity for positive radical change in the way that the criminal justice system approaches sexual offending. And I say that because the level of offending, the volume of casework and the current system operated by our courts means that we simply do not have the ability to support victims of sexual crime and commit our prosecutors to these complex cases mm -hmm. in the way that they deserve and the way that they require. So the fact that so many victims of sexual crime report that they have no confidence in our system is easy to understand and one can see why it would trouble mm -hmm. the Crown Prosecution Service deeply. And this is not a problem that's isolated to Scotland. It's an international problem. It's uh, present in the United Kingdom, England, Wales, Northern Ireland and across the Commonwealth. And uh, for these reasons, we need specialisation. Mm -hmm. We need a root and branch recreation of the court system 
that is directed specifically towards these types of crime. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, uh, Lord Advocate. Um, so just following on from the, probably the, the, the final point that you made about sort of specialism mm -hmm. in particular across the sort of court system, um, one of the questions that we asked um, Lady Dorian in, in, in her session uh, was around the option um, whereby sort of similar benefits to a bespoke sexual offences court, if you like, could be delivered um, through the existing court structure and, and, and Lady Dorian set out her, her, mm. her thinking uh, on that and, and the, the, the findings within the review. So I'd be interested in, in what your, your views are on that um, notion of a, a sexual offence as bespoke court yes. as opposed to um, an arrangement within the existing yeah. court structure. So. I think it's easy to say we can do all of this with what we've got. Mm -hmm. Well, why hasn't that happened? Mm -hmm. It's a simple answer to the question. I think the, we really have to have a principled creation of a specialist court that from the ground up, in every aspect, in the way that it deals with every aspect of the administration of the court, the um, provision of justice, the support for those who are coming to court, the specialisation needed from prosecutors and defence counsel and judges, that we look to see what is necessary and we build what's required. Mm -hmm. And the creation of a specialist court with all of that aim in mind is the way forward. Mm -hmm. What's happening at the moment just isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And all the efforts that's been made over the years to bring in changes such as the rape shield provisions, um, changes in relation to specialisation, the way that we take evidence, evidence by commission, uh, supportive measures for vulnerable witnesses, none of that has shifted the dial on the basic problems that remain, which is complainers' anxiety about becoming involved in any way in the criminal justice process, about their re-traumatisation in the process that's currently in place, and about their lack of understanding, the lack of support that they have, and the feeling that they are abandoned and that justice isn't there for them. Mm -hmm. We have a section of society that says, justice is not there for me. So let's mm -hmm. go about changing that radically and create a court that's just for that purpose. Mm -hmm. That's what's needed. And it would help the Crown enormously mm -hmm. if we had a specialist court that only dealt with uh, sexual crime. It would assist in our management of these cases yeah. Yeah. enormously. Yeah. Th thank you. Okay, I'm going to open um, questions up to members, and I'm firstly going to bring in Sharon Dowie and then Russell Finlay. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Good morning. On the, the specialist courses, does, does the Crown Office have the resources it needs to adapt to a new specialist court being set up in terms of prosecuting in the Sexual Offences Court? Yeah. So I think that we have touched on the financial consequences of the proposals and I can look at that with you. I think the significant issue is the increase in cases that will be dealt with by the Specialist Sexual Offences Court in the sense that what's currently dealt with in the High Court is just a proportion of the sexual offence work that the Crown does. So there is serious sexual offending prosecution work done at summary level, at sheriff and jury level, and in the High Court. And it's important to recognise that we do operate within a budget provided by the Scottish Government, and therefore currently we take a pragmatic approach to operational decisions in relation to how we prepare and pro prosecute cases reported. So consequently, our resources currently are focused on the most serious offending and therefore cases that call in the high court level have a greater level of resource required uh, and to account for the increased preparation and engagement that is present in these cases. So we do put a greater level of resource into the high court in relation to preparation, presentation, dedication of victim support, dedication of advocate deputies' time. That is very different to 
the situation in the sheriff and jury court. Uh, so a practical example I can give you, just to let you understand, is that a trial prosecuted in the high court level would be in, uh, allocated to an individual advocate deputy who would prepare for and conduct the trial, which would be fixed at a floating or dedicated trial diet for a specific date. At sheriff and jury level, the trial prosecutor may be responsible for all the trials that have been fixed across a one or two week period and so may be responsible for the preparation for and conduct of five or six trials during that period as opposed to just a single trial. So to allow the same time for the preparation for trial as in the High Court, the prosecutor would only have to have one case for each jury sitting. So you can see why it would be that in order to shift the level of cases at sheriff and jury level into the special sexual offences court, which I think is a good idea, that we're going to have to have far more resource. And I think we've provided figures for our estimation of what that will mean in terms of costs. At this stage, it is only an estimation, and we've done our best to um, explain that. But the sum and substance of it is that we wouldn't have the resource uh, available to conduct the Special Sexual Offences Court in the way that is, uh, the ambition requires. And at the moment, are you talking about staff resource? The staff resource you're talking about you don't have enough of? No, I'm not talking only about staff resource. I'm talking about a variety of different sources. So we would need to be able to uh, have a greater number of prosecutors, a greater uh, um, a greater number of those involved in supporting victims of sexual crime. If we are going to be able to replicate what we do in the High Court across to the Special Sexual Offences Court and bring within that the, the very serious casework that's prosecuted at sheriff and jury level. So it's across the board and I think in our response to the financial memorandum we've explained what we think at this, this stage the additional resource would be required. Do you think the financial, refer the financial memorandum um, reflects the actual costs? Well, I think that, um, that we're going what to be we've required. said about that is... Um, just have a look and see what we've said about the costs. So we did come back and... I think the, fa the financial uh, memorandum did recognise the potential resource implications for the Crown. And uh, we've also, uh, I think the Cabinet <coughs> Secretary has responded to that. But I think I, I would have to just say that we can only say what we said previously, and that is that we would need a significant increase in our resource. Um, so the Crown... I think it's important to remember the Crown is a demand-led organisation with responsibility to meet state obligations to deliver justice and we operate within a complex criminal justice system. The volume of our casework and the complexity of it continues to grow and there continues to be an increase in complex cases which require longer investigations and court hearings and sexual crime has increased to make up almost 70% of High Court cases. And there's also been a significant increase in domestic abuse cases. Uh, many very serious domestic abuse cases are in our High Court with sexual elements that are, dem demonstrate profound levels of sexual violence being perpetrated in the context of, of domestic relationships. Uh, so violence against women and girls, sexual crime and domestic violence crime will form the bulk of our casework for some many years to come. So uh, what we've done is we looked at the number of High Court indictments and the number of Sheriff and Jury indictments uh, in a year which would meet the criteria for indictment in the Specialist Sexual Offences Court. And this indicated that there would be an increase in 86% an 86% increase in sexual offence cases that would be indicted and prosecuted in the Specialist Sexual Offence Court in, you know, equating to the High Court level. So you're talking about a significant increase 
in sexual offences cases, and that would have a, six, a very significant resource implication for the Crown. And so calculating the potential financial impact of that, uh, we've based our calculations on the average cost per case at each corresponding level of prosecution. And so I think it's important for the committee to know the average cost per case in the High Court uh, for a prosecution is around £75,000 and currently it's just at £7,234 per case at sheriff and jury level. The differential in cost reflects the different processes and practices in the High Court as opposed to the sheriff court level and the nature and type of preparation and presentation that's required to be undertaken by the Crown at each level. So we have projected that it would be reasonable to uh, assess the increased cost of the cases that we'd call in the specialist court as opposed to the sheriff and jury court as being set at a level of perhaps half the average high court case cost, namely £37,157 per case. And that would then mean that it would be an additional cost of about £17 million per annum if you move the cases from the sheriff and jury level into the Special Sexual Offences Court. And as I repeat, we prosecute some very, very serious, complex cases at sheriff and jury level. So the issue is just not about moving business around. It's about a profound change in practice that will have enormous um, implications for the Crown. Okay, and just one final quick question. Um, should the proposed Sexual Offences Court have exclusive jurisdiction to hear sexual offence cases, or can you envisage circumstances in which a case of this nature would still be tried in the High Court? I think you've got to ask the question, what's the purpose of the Specialist Sexual Offences Court? And it's in order to resolve a problem which is described by victims of crime and specialists within the field as a problem that's creating an absence of justice, an absence of access for justice for victims of sexual crime. So if we're going to have a specialist court, it has to be there for the victims of sexual crime. There are some situations where, uh, in the specialist sexual offences court, we probably try, and I think this is within the material available to the committee, some sexual offences uh, charges in combination with some very serious other charges, such as murder charges. Um, but I, 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 if you're going to have a specialist court, it's got to deliver for the purpose that is required. So I, I don't see why we would have a specialist court and then opt to put these specialist cases in the High Court, which is dealing with more general work. OK, thank you. Thank you. I think Rona Mackay, you want to come in. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good, good morning, Lord Advocate. Um, I just wondered if you think a specialist court would um, eliminate the need for floating trial diets, which cause a lot of distress to victims. So I, I know that um, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service have indicated that the, the use of floating trial diets is essential in order for them to properly administer their business. And I know that when Lord Bonamy's review in relation to uh, the High Court that recommended the preliminary hearing system for sexual offences trials, recommended that um, we shouldn't have floating trial diets for rape victims because of the uncertainty that it brings. Uh, so I would hope that within the specialist court, in order for them to operate in a trauma-formed way, they would very much bear in mind the impact that floating trial diets has on a victim and recognise that it's inconsistent with trauma-informed practice mm -hmm. to have floating trial diets that float from one period of a float to another without the case starting. Mm -hmm. And I know that the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service have identified figures that would indicate that within a float, over 90% of the cases start within a four-day period. And I think that we have expressed with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service an anxiety over whether or not those statistics are sufficiently robust. Mm. 
And that is against a background of a challenge for the whole of the Scottish criminal justice system to get data that is reliable across the board in these cases. And our assessment is that really the figures on, the figures produced by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service only take into account cases where the trial actually commences during the float and don't take into account cases which don't proceed to evidence being led due to a plea, desertion or more commonly adjournment. And our figures for the year 2020-2023 indicate that um, it was only in 64% of trials that they actually did commence within the float. And so that means that 35% um, of cases don't proceed to trial and only 61% of complainers will actually give evidence during a float. Yeah. So I would hope that it, would, it, it could assist mm -hmm. in the move towards doing away with floating trial sure. diets. Yeah. I think that would be work in progress yeah. in fairness to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I can say from personal experience from prosecuting cases in the High Court of a sexual nature <coughs> that it is very traumatic for mm -hmm. the victim to be waiting to find out when they're going to be called to give evidence yeah. and waiting for a phone call at four o'clock in the afternoon and being on the edge of your seat all day and for that to be the process mm -hmm. that set, essentially sets you up yeah. before you come to give the evidence in the most important mm -hmm. part of the case is just not the way to proceed yeah. at all. Yeah. I recognise we might come on to the benefits of early uh, recording of evidence, mm -hmm. but there's some victims that don't want that mm -hmm. and some victims want to come to court mm -hmm. and see their accused in court. Sure. And so there's no one size fits all for the process, mm -hmm. but I, I think that floating trial diets are a problem mm -hmm. that is... Uh, a profound problem yeah. and it's deeply upsetting to victims waiting for their case to be heard and it's challenging for the prosecutor mm -hmm. waiting for the case also to come in to be aware of the strains and stresses on the victim yeah. and it's challenging for those within the criminal justice system to be responsible for delivering the message that your case isn't starting today mm -hmm. or tomorrow or the next day mm -hmm. that yeah. is it's just not conducive to trauma-informed practice mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Um, Russell Finlay, followed by John Swinney. Thank you very much, Kevin. And good morning, Lord Advocate. Good morning. Um, a fairly general question to kick off with. And we've heard some very strongly opposing views over the past few weeks and months uh, in relation to the legislation. And the head of Rape Crisis Scotland told us that it's, and I quote, obvious to anyone that guilty men are regularly walking free. And the Faculty of Advocates of which I assume you are or were a member, say that the system works ostensibly. Mm. Um, now you've been ex very clear today for the need for sort of radical and profound reform and legislation being the only way to achieve that. But I just wonder whether you think the legislation will achieve that reform that you believe is needed. Yeah. So uh, uh, can I start by saying I remain a member of the Faculty of Advocates. I was um, independent counsel at the Scottish Bar. Uh, 30 years, I think, is uh, the period of time that I've been in practice at the Scottish Bar. And I've been a Silk a Queen's Council, now King's Council, since 1994. And in my period of private practice, I undertook a significant proportion of my career, which is unusual, to dedicate to, to public service, prosecuting in the public interest. And I was a prosecutor for eight years, and I was uh, successful in being the first woman to be appointed to principal advocate deputy, the most senior prosecutor in this country, uh, and I was very proud to hold that position. In my period of practice as a prosecutor, I identified all the problems that uh, rape crisis have reported on, uh, and all of the problems that are reflected in Lady Dorian's review, I experienced all of these firsthand as a prosecutor. These are issues that are not made up. They are profound problems. And they've been in existence from the time that I was a prosecutor. And uh, the, unless we change radically, we're not going to make any difference. And I think, so I, I do believe, as Lord Advocate, 
and with my experience, having dedicated a very pr significant proportion of my career to prosecution and the public service, that we, we do need legislative change and we do need changes to be brought about by specialisation. I think that it's come to be appreciated that the ordinary adversarial system is not well suited to the prosecution of these cases. It requires specialisation. The needs of the victims require the most careful consideration and provision of effective support. Um, special measures in the manner in which a victim gives evidence and the existence of rape shield provisions have not resolved the issues. Uh, Scotland and UK and other countries across the Commonwealth are considering and consulting on further developments such as independent legal representation, judge-only trials, because many of the victims of these crimes are plainly not receiving justice. So I think that we need the sort of change this Parliament's interested in. But in addition to that, we must as a society overcome the cultural attitudes that allow prolific abuse of women and girls to occur within plain sight. So we need change here, and I mean, yeah. we, but we need societal change too. And I think we, it has to be a combination of both. I mean, it's, yeah, it's incredible to think that it was two years after you were, um, became a QC that the first female Scottish judge was appointed in 1996. That's right. Which is, of course, less than 30 years ago, and it's perhaps taken women in these positions to drive a lot of this need for, for change. Yes, I think as lawyers and as parliamentarians trusted with the administration of justice, we must find a method of ensuring justice for, that, for the so many victims of the appalling acts of sexual and physical violence. And we need a proper functioning judicial process that delivers that. And that's all that's been asked for a judicial process that delivers for victims of crime. And I, th I think the need for that is exemplified by the very serious crimes now we're seeing prosecuted at high court level. And just to give you one example, in last year, we saw a case prosecuted in the high court, which was a case in respect of which the accused had been a prolific domestic abuser from the age of 14. And he murdered his partner after an 18-month relationship, which included physical and emotional abuse. Six previous partners of his gave evidence in the High Court of the most extensive level of domestic violence and sexual violence that had escalated over all of his period of time from the age of 14 to the age of 30 when he committed this, this, this very serious crime. He seriously assaulted the complainer on the day prior to her death and she was admitted to hospital. He then attended at the hospital and persuaded her to discharge herself against medical advice. He then drove her to a garage where he dealt in drugs and during that night he beat her to death with a tire iron. He faced 33 charges in total and six of those involved uh, serious previous partners. So that is exemplary of the type of cases we are seeing in the High Court and it tells you why. We need to say to ourselves, as lawyers, as parliamentarians, as those who serve the public because we are public servants, what do we do to sort this out? And we need to make a radical change. And it's not good enough to say it's, everything's fine. It simply is not. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now, moving to the subject of anonymity for victims, which is proposed in the legislation, the Crown's submission to the committee makes quite what appears to be a very important point about a potential oversight yes. relating to the proposed anonymity uh, measure. Um, as drafted, it seems that anonymity would apply or would not apply in cases where the outcome was one of acquittal, mm. um, which then may result in victims being deterred from reporting crime, which is completely at odds with the intent yes. of the legislation and trauma, trauma and fraud practice and so on. Um, since making the submission to the committee, can you tell us if the Scottish Government has had any communication with Crown about yes, this? Yes, they have. Yeah. Yes, I think they, they, they've taken on board a lot of the issues that we've raised and they're, they're um, 
considering the issue, uh, it's not being ignored, it's being worked on, and I think you can see the, the logic in remedying this, this deficiency. So in all likelihood there will be an amendment from the government? I understand right. so. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, now, judge only rape trials. Um, there's another issue about these which we've not yet touched upon. Um, judges would be required to provide written reasons for their decisions, which is an unusual um, thing to be <coughs> happening in the, in the Scottish courts, mm -hmm. um, in cr cr criminal courts rather. Um, now the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission has warned that this might generate a significant number of appeals, and they say this risks adding to victims' distress, and again that would be at odds with the Bill's trauma-informed intent. Does the Crown Office have a view on this particular issue? So, I, just in relation to the pilot, I, I think that the point that needs to be, the starting point needs to be, I think the proposal represents an integral part of the recommendations of Lady Dorian's review. And uh, I think that it's a suite of measures that she's recommended. So the pilot's an integral part of that. And I think that what will happen, I hope, by reason of the, the um, pilot being uh, delivered on, is that it will allow an evidence base for further consideration of what it is that is wrong with the current system that, that results in such a diversion between levels of conviction in one type of crime as opposed to sexual crime. So I think the review was split down, uh, it was halfway, split halfway in relation to whether or not to recommend the pilot. But the whole purpose of that is to give a basis upon which to then develop a reasoned approach to the future way of dealing with these uh, cases. Hence the need for the written What opinions? are the written reasons? Right. So, so the written reasons will, it will be, it, it, I think it will be a very important part of it because it might remove a perceived deficiency in the current system. Uh, I think the suggestion is that we provide an entirely altered experience in court for the victims of crime. And crucially for all concerned, the accused and the victim, it would provide for a reasoned and written decision explaining why a particular outcome was arrived at. And the, the public have confidence in the judiciary, which will be reinforced by the provision of written reasons. So the judiciary in our country is, uh, is something that we should be proud of. Uh, and the independence of the judiciary is something that we all protect fiercely. And judges day and daily in our court of session and in our sheriff courts sit on their own dealing with very serious matters and the issue of written reasons. And they sit on their own in criminal matters. They sit on their own in very complex court of session matters. And I'm yet to hear that there's a suggestion that that process is inconsistent with the rule of law and is inconsistent with a fair judicial process. So the benefit of the pilot would be written reasons in order to inform why it is that the conviction rate is at it, as it is. And I think the important point is the pilot is for a time-limited period only for a special uh, section of cases which we call acquaintance type cases and that is the case where you have one complainer and one accused and in our experience and on the basis of the statistical analysis that we've been able to do on again our data collection is is uh, something that we are concerned about but on our statistical analysis currently and on our experience as prosecutors, it is in these acquaintance type rapes that you have very low levels of conviction. And so the current conviction rates disguise the fact that in acquaintance type rapes, we are looking at conviction rates about 20 to 25 per cent, as opposed to the overall conviction rate that's been reported. So the, yeah. that is being disguised. And I think it was why that selection of cases was identified. Yeah. It's time limited and uh, the written reasons will allow 
us all to move on and to understand whether or not it's rape myths, uh, whether or not there's something else going on. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, John Swinney, followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you. Lord Advocate, one of the comments you made in, in response to um, uh, Russell Finlay's questions this morning was that, in your judgment, um, and this was in relation to your point about the, the difference of views expressed by Rape Crisis Scotland and the faculty in relation to the system, you said that the ordinary adversarial approach is not suited to cases of this type. Yes. And I'd like to explore that comment because I think, in a sense, I think that gets to the heart of some of the points I was exploring with Lady Dorian this morning about culture within the court. And I'm interested to know whether you... you know, how. What are the nature of the changes that need to take place within a specialist sexual crimes court and the approaches that are taken in there that are necessary <coughs> to live up to that challenge that you've set out in that mm -hmm. comment, that the ordinary adversarial approach is not suited to cases of this type? Mm -hmm. What is it that needs to be different? So I, I think that the... A good place to start is the fact that in 2020, in a case of Gavin Watson MacDonald, the appeal court in Scotland, it's only 2020, criticised the trial judge, the Crown and the defence for a number of serious deficiencies which resulted in the young woman who'd been attacked being paid damages because of the effect on her of the actual trial process. She was severely traumatised as a result and suffered an exacerbation of her mental health problems. The Lord Justice General, the most senior judge in Scotland, said that the trial was conducted in a manner which flew in the face of basic rules of evidence and procedure, not only the rape shield provisions but also the common law. He said it ignored a number of principles which have been laid down and emphasised in several principles uh, that were uh, set down in recent decisions of the Appeal Court. And he said this, if justice is to prevail in the prosecution of sexual offences, it's imperative that those representing parties abide by these basic rules. He said if they do not do so, the judge or sheriff must intervene to remedy the matter. During her cross-examination, this complainer was subjected to repetitive and, at times, irrelevant questioning. She became extremely distressed, and rightly so. The court did nothing to intervene. Were this to be repeated, the situation in sexual offences trials would be unsustainable. So that was in 2020, and those sta that statement was made by the Lord Justice General because of the way that a trial was conducted. It was at sheriff and jury level, but it was a very serious sexual offence against a young girl. And it was against that background that Lady Dorian's review uh, was conducted, and against that background in which she made her recommendations. So it requires root and branch reform, and it requires everybody across the board to recognise that these cases require specialisation. You need, as a lawyer, to train yourself to understand what's needed to prosecute these cases properly and what's needed to defend them properly. And the judiciary need to understand that there's a whole specialisation in this field that needs to be uh, understood and they require training on. It is, to my mind, an area of prosecution work that is in its infancy and the beginnings will start the beginnings of a real way to deal with all the problems is the creation of a specialist court so practices within the court across the board the way in which we deal with evidence in the court the way justice is administered the way people are uh, dealt with supported respected the the humane aspect needs to be uppermost in everybody's mind so that we develop a progressive, humane justice system that delivers justice to everybody across the board. And it's that profound level of change that's required. And I, I think we just need to reflect on the fact what the McDonald case was in 2020. 
So, th thank you for that, Lord Advocate. Now, th that, that strikes me as essentially acknowledging that there are cultural questions that need to be addressed, and obviously the, the, um, the, the, the words of the Lord Justice General in, that, in the Macdonald case illustrate some serious failings in the protection that all of us would expect there to be in place there for yeah. a witness, i.e. that you know, a member of the judiciary can step in to make sure things are done properly. And the Lord Justice General's uh, conclusions in the appeal obviously demonstrate that was not the case. So there's a the, the, there's the cultural element mm. about ensuring that leadership and practitioners mm. are operating prop, uh, effectively, but is there also procedural questions that need to be addressed about the operation of the courts in relation to the handling of cases of this type? So I think there was a, there there were recommendations in relation to directions to juries and the way that things could be improved upon in Lady Doreen's review. I think she touched on, on those. In terms of procedural improvements, the most fundamental procedural improvement has to be, as far as we can, the elimination of delay in these cases, mm -hmm. to bring about a system that is supportive and provides prompt uh, decision-making. Uh, the delay needs to be eradicated as far as possible in relation to the way in which uh, um, victims are supported in court. Um, again, that could be improved on. Uh, I think the, the, the um, review touched on independent legal representation in relation to applications under the reach field provisions. I see these as an important step forward. Um, but procedurally, the biggest thing could be the eradication of delay and the taking away the sense of the process not being capable of being relied on. There has to be the procedural changes must be capable of delivering to those who have been victims of a crime a confidence that the process will be supportive and be capable of delivering what's required. And I see that these procedural changes and an increase in confidence in the prosecution system would ultimately increase across the board victims of sexual crime confidence in the process because we know that a major issue is that the majority of sexual crime is not reported because people haven't got the faith in the system that it will give them what they require. And I think that's, that's present in, in, uh, in Scotland and I think it's also something that has been touched on very recently uh, in England and Wales by two very recent reports. I think that um, just looking at um, um, the work that was done by the eighth, yes, the eighth report by the House of Commons Home Affairs Committee on the investigation and prosecution of rape, they reported that public confidence in the ability of the criminal justice system to respond to reports to rape, to support victims and survivors, and ultimately bring perpetrators to justice is what could be at its lowest point. Police forces in England and Wales recently recorded the highest ever number of rapes within a 12-month period, yet only 1.3 of re recorded rape offences have been assigned an outcome, resulted in a charge or a summons. So these were very low figures of cases that were actually then taken up. And I think that was also reflective of what the Victims Commissioner in England and Wales also reported, is that... Um, that the people are ang are worried about reporting these cases and the uh, three quarters of those who went to court said that their cross-examination was traumatising and the vast majority of people agreed that um, the, the whole process was um, invasive uh, as the actual offence and 95% of survivors who didn't make a report to police cited a fear of being disbelieved and the fact that they'd heard negative things about the trial process. So it's, you know, this fundamental change in the trial process, I hope would 
go some way to ameliorating the problems at large, which is that in Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland and across the Commonwealth, the majority of people do not report sexual crime because of the lack of um, confidence in the system. But you, you, your, answer, your answer there, Lord Advocate, opens up a, a wider question, which I accept, which is that this is, um, you know, a lot of this is about how a court, the court proceedings are handled. But an awful lot of it is about a whole justice system approach, whether it's the actions of Police Scotland, the operation of the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service, the role of the Crown, the role of defence agents, faculty, law society and ultimately the judiciary to shepherd this process. Um, there's quite a number of players there and I I'm struck that um, you know, eradicating delay in the system is, needs everybody mm. to improve their performance and to get there faster and quicker and more effectively. What is the best means of driving that? Because it strikes me that, as I look at those organisations, Police Scotland, Scottish Court, Court and Tribunal Service, the Crown, the practitioners and the judiciary, all of them are kind of self-governing self institutions. Mm. So who drives the process? Mm -hmm. The government will get criticised if it drives it too aggressively because that will be interference. Mm -hmm. So where within the system does the necessary drive come from to eradicate the delays? Mm -hmm. and, how, and, how, and I suppose maybe a better way of putting it is, how can, we, how can we get those different players who are all critical in the process to be focused on, that eradicate, on the eradication of delays? Mm. Yes, yeah, so obviously we have an enormous challenge at the moment with court delays because of the COVID backlog. Um, that's something that you know we have to bear in mind. But it is about streamlining processes and making making it easier for victims to report and for the cases to be brought to court more quickly. And I think we can all try individually in all our, our areas of work to seek to improve, but it does need an overriding, overarching uh, overseer, a sense of bringing it all together. Um, it's, it is difficult because different parts of the justice system operate independently of each other for good reason, in okay. order to protect the interests of the accused, mm -hmm. quite rightly, in order to protect the independence of the judiciary, to respect the independence of the investigation authorities and the prosecutors, uh, the prosecution service. Um, but I think it can only come about through a common understanding of what's required and people working together with a common goal. And uh, I, I see the development of specialisation, the creation of a, a single court and everybody working towards the processes uh, developed by that court as a very significant part in bringing matters to a better place. The delay has to come about through uh, resourcing of the uh, police investigation appropriately and resourcing of the Crown work appropriately, proper management uh, of the Crown work and then proper management of the court process. Mm -hmm. In terms of support for victims of crime, I, I do recognise that there, the Crown can only do so much. Uh, the Crown operate in the public interest and I do see the public interest as a wide concept and within that public interest it's important that the Crown do what they can to support victims of crime through a very challenging process. But in addition to that, the development of a one-stop shop, I think, a system whereby victims can go to one resource and get a full explanation of all the different parts of the criminal justice process and what they can deliver for them is also a very important part in what can be done to improve matters. 
but delay will require a transformation in the way in which we deal with the processes in and around the reporting and in the prosecution of these cases. Um, my last question, Kavina, is <coughs> in relation to the, the, the procedures of a specialist court. And, um, and, and I, I, I'm going to raise specific material from the bill, but I, you know, I, I obviously acknowledge that the, the bill is not for the Lord Advocate to, to argue for. But it, Section 55 in the bill, um, it, it, it states that the provisions of the 1995 Act apply to proceedings in the Sexual Offences Court, as though the proceedings were taking place in the High Court of Justiciary. And to my layman's reading of that, that worries me a little bit, that mm -hmm. we won't have a fresh start. Mm -hmm. Reassure me on that point. Well, um, I suppose what I can say about that is this. Obviously, the judiciary are, are um, responsible for the administration of the courts. It's the president, uh, Lord President, as head of the, the uh, court justice system, that's responsible ultimately for the way that the courts administer their business. Um, I, I, in relation to the procedures that are there within the, the um, Criminal Procedure Scotland Act. There is the ability within that act for very significant case management being uh, undertaken by the judiciary at a stage at which a case is indicted. So the preliminary hearing system that we have in the High Court, recently um, taken over to the Sheriff and Jury Court, allows for judicial management of cases in a very strong way. And judicial management can um, look at the case uh, in a very robust way and put the prosecutor and defence counsel on the spot in relation to all that's needed in relation to witnesses who are being cited, uh, the way in which, uh, for example, in relation to question of children, how question of children should be done, whether or not the defence do need more time in order to explore areas in the case, what is the case actually about, what is the defence in this case, what can be agreed. So the case management system uh, adjudicated by the court, uh, by the presiding judge, is a very significant way in which the court processes can be applied in a way that would be beneficial to the overall administration of justice. So. I think the benefit of the Specialist Sexual Offences Court with specialist judges dealing with these cases who will be seeing the same type of cases regularly, they will begin to appreciate where it is that in terms of case management improvements can be made and how it is that trauma-informed practice can be applied appropriately to the way in which the case progresses through the court system. And so case management, which is provided for very extensively in the uh, in a sense, in the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act, and all of the requirements in around disclosure, defence statements and the rest, these are the tools that are available to the judiciary. And I, 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 I see that combined with specialisation that we would see an improvement in the case management of these cases. I would hope that to be very much the case. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Holly McNeill, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Lord Advocate, and uh, may I thank you for being so vocal on the importance of actually doing something in this Parliament on the scandalous uh, number of uh, increasing cases and in sexual offences, so thank you for that. Um, I'm interested in the mechanics of the specialist court. I mean, I think a good case has been made by Lord Justice Clark and yourself, but my questions relate to how would this operate and how does it fit in with the current um, court system? Um, you gave the committee some useful figures earlier on talking about um, the cost of um, cases in the High Court but also in the Sheriff Court. And I suppose my first question is, do you think the government fully appreciates what the resource implication of this is. I'm trying to get my head around what this will look like 
it looks like it will be a substantially large court with a substantially large number of cases and it uh, will, will not be part of the High Court. Um, it will be separate from the High Court, although, as Lady Dorian said, her vision was very much it would be a parallel court. Well, yes. that isn't trained in the legislation, as I uh, question Lady Dorian on that. But that, that aside, do you think the government fully appreciates the resource implications for setting up such a court? I think that really would be a matter for the, the government uh, uh, to respond to. Okay. I am here as the Lord Advocate, the independent head of the Criminal Prosecution Service responsible for prosecution of crime and the investigation of deaths. And what I can do is to say what the impact will be. It's just not moving business. If you're going to make the change, mm -hmm. you need to apply the resource. And I think it shows you that the... The, the, the figures that I am able to provide show you the big challenges at sheriff and jury level and what we are asking of our prosecutors at sheriff and jury level to do in cases that are just as complex. The decision to prosecute at sheriff and jury level as opposed to the high court can come down to very fine decisions and it's the nature of the offence that's relevant to the forum, not the complexity of the case. We see very complex institutional abuse cases being prosecuted at sheriff and jury level. Um, and we're seeing sentences, uh, high sentences of five years regularly handed out at sheriff and jury level. So it's not the complexity of the case, it's the nature of the offence that determines forum. So moving sheriff and jury business in sexual offences cases to the High Court will not mean that we're bringing in less complex cases or less serious cases. Uh, sometimes it's just a simple uh, difference between whether or not there's been a penetrative act as opposed to a non-penetrative act in a sexual case that would determine forum because of the exp possible exposure to sentence. But, you know, these are fine distinctions that actually probably victims of serious sexual crime wouldn't understand um, uh, whether it was penetration or not. And what we found through the evidence from the children's, Scottish Children's Abuse Inquiry, which is a very important piece of work, is that victims of this type of crime, sometimes the, sometimes the non-penetrative acts, the really nasty, sadistic type of conduct, is far more impactful, far more um, damaging than a, a penetrative type of act in a different context. So I think we really need to appreciate it. It is not just about moving business. We are dealing with very complex areas of work. And it's the combination of that alongside the increase in levels of pre-recorded evidence will have a profound impact on our budget and we can't without the necessary resource meet that and we can't do it with the current resource. Thank you. So I suppose it's that fine line that you mm. talked about earlier as to where cases go, whether mm. they go to the currently go to the High Court or the Sheriff Court. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about in the case of um, the High Courts on AD would be, we have a single case mm -hmm. and the cost of that. Um, that fine line will not disappear then in, under the, the, the specialist court. In other words, who are you going to instruct to take on those cases? Will there be ADs mm. that will take on those cases? How will you decide that then if there's no distinction between, at the moment, cases that have to go to the high court and cases that have to, or you've decided to go to the sheriff court? See what so I mean? So, from my, from my perspective, I would, I see the specialist sexual offences court as being the Supreme Court, along, sitting alongside the High Court, the Supreme Court in the prosecution of our sexual crime. And in our High Court, advocate deputies with my commission prosecute these cases. And I certainly wouldn't see any diminution in the quality, training and standard of prosecutor. And so for the, high, the Special Sexual Offences Court, from my perspective, I don't see it being anything other than an advocate deputy prosecuting with extended rights of audience. So it wouldn't be someone who didn't have extended rights of audience to prosecute in the High Court that would be mm -hmm. uh, prosecuting these cases. They, they are very serious cases. And if we're going to deal with them appropriately, 
and give them the recognition that they deserve, I foresee it being advocate deputies prosecuting these mm. cases because it's going to be part of the High Court. Yes, thank you. I, mean, I think that's what those interested would expect to happen because mm. in the many uh, proposals over the years in this Parliament about how we deal with rape cases, maintaining the seriousness of rape, which currently can only be prosecuted in the High Court, I think is really, really important. It's important to me, certainly, and I know many others. Um, does that therefore mean that, in your view, that we should legislate to ensure that? Because a future Lord Advocate might take a different view. That would be my worry. So I'm, I'm very content with your answer on this, but I'm interested to protect that, that fine line. I mean, arguably, I can think of cases that, in my opinion, um, should have gone to the High Court. That, you know, I understand that that's a fine line because of the seriousness of it. And I completely take the point that you know, there are so many factors to consider. But who prosecutes and who has rights of audience and who represents the accused, I really feel strongly there should be no change to mm -hmm. that if we're changing the nature of the court. I just wondered if you could respond to that. Yes, yeah, so uh, I recognise the distinction in our roles, Ms McNeill, and you are an elected Member of Parliament representing your constituents and the voice of the Scottish people. And I think that all I can do is seek to inform you as to what the current prosecutorial view is across Scotland in relation to these types of offences. And it's this. They are the most challenging, difficult cases that we prosecute. They concern us greatly. They, they're, the, they're the thing that we talk about most. They're the issue that gives us the greatest cause for concern. There's not a single member of the prosecution service that I've met that joined the prosecution service in order to do these cases badly. Everybody wants to do them well and wants to do them to the best of their ability. I see the prosecution of these types of cases as of critical importance to the whole of the criminal justice system. And I would see no diminution at all being applied to the standard of prosecutor that would be taking these cases if the sexual offence court was part of the High Court. It would be High Court prosecutors. As I've said previously, I consider this issue to be the challenge of our generation as prosecutors. We need to resolve these issues in and around sexual crime. They have a profound impact on the victims. They ruin lives. We've got to do something about it. We've got to have a better system. Thank you very much. This is my final question. Um, some of us attended a roundtable discussion with rape crisis, and as you would expect, as you have said in your evidence, um, the experience of rape and sexual offence um, uh, victims is just appalling. Mm -hmm. We did have one survivor who came to the, who came to the roundtable um, to say that they had a completely different experience, mm -hmm. but it was very recent. And she talked about um, how she got some time with Advocate mm -hmm. Debut and her experience was really positive. So I take from that that maybe there's already some changes in the system. But my question is, do you think as a standard practice, and I appreciate all the implications for resources when I'm asking this question, um, been able to have a, a meeting with the Advocate Deputy the Prosecutor? And even if... Because I have heard of cases where victims have said... They've sat in complete frustration in the court where they feel that the prosecutor has not maybe mentioned something that's really important. Mm -hmm. Now, I fully appreciate the independence of the practitioner mm -hmm. and I realise that's an important principle. But do you think that maybe there should be more exposure for victims in relation to the prosecution mm -hmm. of their cases or not? So I have always, in my time as an advocate deputy, met a victim of sexual crime before he or she gave evidence in court. And uh, that was something that I was a great supporter of from very early on. And I've never changed my view on that. And it is the practice in the High Court that advocate deputies meet victims of this type of crime before they give their evidence. I'd like to do that better and our current review of sexual offences, I hope, will deliver on that. Uh, I think there's a greater challenge in the Sheriff and Jury Court, where you can see the pressures on the prosecutor 
and the greater burden of casework they have and the, the resources available there are very different. But I think that I can say this. I know how to do these cases. And it requires a significant support for the victim of the crime. And it requires meeting the victim of the crime to give them the necessary confidence that the prosecutor understands them, understands the case, and gives them some assistance in preparing for giving evidence. And I, I would like to give you one example, and I think it's a really important one. I put my skill and experience, and I don't make out that I'm anything particularly special, to critical use in the trial of a man called Mark Adams. He had an OBE. He was a 54-year-old businessman, a graduate of Cambridge University, and a former private secretary to John Major and Tony Blair. And he was convicted of the rape and sexual assault of an 18-year-old student at Edinburgh City Centre when she was on her way home from a night out during the festival in 2019. The case demonstrates that this type of offending is not just restricted to any particular class of person. The accused was a man of outstanding intellect and he'd been honoured by the monarch. With support, understanding and careful guidance given in the meetings that I had with the young woman pre-trial, supported by a member of the Procurator Fiscal Service, she was able to overcome her fears and give evidence in court with the use of a screen and supporter. When I first met that young woman, she was shaking so much she could barely get into the room. And she was transformed from somebody without any impropriety on my part, with support, proper guidance and direction, to be able to come into court and give her evidence with a screen and supporter. And she gave powerful and compelling evidence and the jury returned a unanimous guilty verdict. Now, we know how to do these cases. We would like to do them that way, but we need the resources for it. Thank you very much. Fulton McGregor. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, um, uh, thank you for your very powerful evidence so far, including uh, what you've just said there. Um, I was wanting to ask about something that I'd asked um, in the previous session as well. I don't know if, if you've seen it or not, and that's about the independent legal representation. Yes. What, what are your views on this? Because I think that what I'm getting from your submission is that the Crown Office uh, is generally supportive of the mm -hmm. idea and the provisions, but does envisage some problems. And I think yeah. that you've, you've outlined some ways that they might be resolved. I wonder if you could just expand yes. on that. Yes. So the, the Crown aren't the victim's lawyers, and that is part of the fundamental problem. Whilst we can do some things within the concept of the public interest, we can't do everything that an independent lawyer would be able to do. And that was really what underpinned, I think, the recognition that you need independent legal representation on the issue of the rape shield provisions because the impact on the victim's Article 8 rights and the victim has individual rights in relation to the issues that arise in and around the 275 application. Mm. So in relation to that application, before it's granted, it requires the, the applications made in court and the defence required to set out whether evidence should be admitted or elicited, what the nature of the questioning that is proposed, the issue at trial which the evidence is considered to be relevant, the reasons as to why that evidence is considered relevant in the trial, and the inferences which the applicant proposes to submit to the court that should draw from the evidence. So there's very clear statutory provision. So a properly drafted 275 application should contain sufficient evidence to enable the parties to be able to identify what the evidence is within the case that's relevant to the uh, evidence that should be elicited. So what is it within the case that the defence need to cross-examine the complainer on in order to properly pursue their defence case? What is it? So in order to determine whether or not that's right, there has to be a question mark over the extent to which the Crown would be responsible for uh, receiving the application and thereafter identifying the evidence that would be necessary 
for them to properly advise the complainer and her lawyer to prepare the relevant arguments. So if you have an independent legal representative in this area of the, the, the criminal justice process, they've got to be able to understand what the evidence is, how they could oppose it, the application. So they've got to have access to the material in court. And so we have to have a process by which that material is going to be disclosed. Mm -hmm. And we're anxious to ensure that that process of disclosure is done, is <coughs> reviewed independently, properly protects the rights of the accused, and doesn't draw the Crown into difficulties in relation to <coughs> excuse me, whether or not they're actually acting consistently with their independent role. So what we're saying is in relation to the way that the ILR operates, the court really is in a position to <coughs> hear submissions from the parties on whether or not the 275 application has merit. Mm. Thereafter, understand what it is within the, the case that requires to be disclosed. And thereafter, for the court to oversee that process, I think it's very dangerous to put all of that responsibility in the hands of the Crown. Uh, that is deciding what the evidence is that should be disclosed and being responsible for the disclosure. I think there has to be a proper sort of sifting mechanism in the 275 process. So the application should be made, the court looks at it, is it, is it something that's got merit, is it not? Is it something that should be intimated to the complainer? Should it not? Mm. Because we know the intimation of these sorts of documents can be profoundly traumatising on victims. And then a proper consideration of what material it is that the defence, the independent legal representative, has to have access to in order to properly frame any opposition. So it really, I think it's important that we look at it with care not just say it's then the responsibility of the Crown to administer. I think we need to have a proper process in court that protects the rights of the accused, protects the independence of the Crown, delivers a proper process for the victim, ensures that it's trauma-informed, and you're not opening up a can of worms and allowing these applications to be sent to victims of sexual crime in a way that doesn't properly administer them with a trauma-informed lens before they actually receive them. Um, we don't always get it right in the Crown, but we have set down very careful safeguards for the way in which we speak to victims about the fact that there's been an application in relation to the rape shield provisions. We have very, very many vulnerable individuals who, in respect of giving that information to, would cause them severe problems, severe mental health problems. We deal with some of the most vulnerable people in society and you don't want to have a system that's going to make it worse. And you don't want to have a system that puts a burden on the Crown, that is unnecessary, and you don't want a system that's not properly adjudicated upon and administered by the court. So I think what you're saying there is, uh, uh, you know, just going back to suppose your submission, is that you, know, you, are, you are supportive of this. It would, uh, it's not fair to put it all on the Crown, but it does need to be thought out in terms of yeah. how, how it's going to... Um, work in practice. Yeah, I think it really needs thought out. I also think that in relation to the profession at large who will be taking on this role, that um, my I would be concerned to ensure that there's a proper process of accreditation for uh, solicitors who are becoming involved in this work, who have no experience of prosecuting in the public interest, mm -hmm. and who will operate it in pri private practice. <coughs> yeah. you, we, we, as I say, we don't always get it right in the crime. We're trying really hard to make improvements, but you don't want just to take that away, give it to an area of the profession that isn't properly um, trained and doesn't realise the profound implications of being involved with very vulnerable complainers in relation to an issue as sensitive and as important as um, an application to pierce the rape shield provisions. Uh, and obviously, uh, my question so far and in the earlier session uh, was focusing on 
independent uh, legal representation around the rape shield pr provisions, mm -hmm. as you say. And as Lady Dorian said, she only recommended it for that. But I just wondered what your thoughts were for perhaps independent legal representation being provided for complainers in, in a wider context, so perhaps at the start of, um, you, you know, maybe when they first make a complaint, because a lot of the evidence that we've heard, uh, and I'm sure you've heard it as well, is that when somebody goes to make a complaint in these situations, they make a complaint to the police and then that, that's it, almost, for them in terms of until they next hear about, mm. you know, contact from the criminal justice system. So do you think there's a role there for independent legal advice at an earlier stage being provided so that somebody could go through with people how, how things might might pan out? So I, th I think that's something that would be worthy of consideration, but it's certainly not something that I've given consideration to before today. But what I would say is this, that if we had a system whereby it was properly trauma-informed, the police engage with victims of crime appropriately, and the victim support services operated in a way that provided holistic wraparound care that's necessary, and the Crown did what was necessary in relation to engagement with victims, then I don't see the need for it. Um, in my view, in relation to what the Crown can do in engagement with victims, is that we can do a lot more, uh, a lot more effectively. And Suzanne Tanner Casey's review is going to be reporting, I think, in February, making recommendations in that regard. But the example that I gave you of the case that I prosecuted is an example of what we can achieve. And I know that the victim in that case was supported properly and um, I know from the reports that I received afterwards that she felt justice had been served. So we have the tools available at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's just better management, greater understanding and a drive to improve and, and it is also better resourcing that's required. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And I think finally, uh, Rona Mackay. Just a quick question. I was just um, thinking back to the first evidence session you gave this committee at the, at the start of the session, and you said that radical reform would be needed to tackle uh, men's <coughs> violence against women and girls, and I'm, I'm thinking that we're coming to that now. Mm -hmm. this, is, this could be the start of it. Um, but I wanted to ask you, at, um, so you support um, a pilot of uh, single-judge um, rape trials. Do you have any concerns about that? I, I support it um, for the reasons that uh, have, have been expressed. Uh, my anxiety is to ensure that when the Parliament takes a decision on that, that it's done against the background of a properly informed, reasoned debate. That's the anxiety that I have about it. And I don't see that anybody's voice should be discounted. The review itself was split down the middle. Mm. There were powerful arguments for and powerful arguments against. And um, lawyers are good at presenting powerful arguments sometimes. And so I'm afraid what I would say is it's over to the parliamentarians now. It's what you believe to be appropriate in the, in the interests of your, your, the people of Scotland. You're the democratically elected legislator and uh, you now have your place to, to um, do what you think is the right thing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think, Sharon Dowie, you're yeah, just, indicating you want to ask a very short question. Just a very short question in the last point. Um, on the judicial rape trials, do you think that provisions for this should have been laid out in the bill itself rather than laying out a power for Scottish ministers to pilot this using secondary legislation? I, I think that's not a matter for me. I, no. I, I think the, the, the terms of the bill and what ministers decide on the way forward in relation to the legislation is a matter for ministers, not the Lord Advocate. Um, but uh, I would say that um, it's, it is the case that everybody within the system requires to understand there needs to be a change in culture and views and legal change is not enough. 
Thank you very much. OK, I think on that note, we'll bring the session to a close. So uh, can I thank you, Lord Advocate, for joining us today? It's been a very uh, interesting and useful session. Uh, so on that, we'll just have a short suspension to allow for a change of witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, members. So we now move on to our next panel uh, for today. And can I welcome David Fraser, Executive Director at Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, and Danielle McLaughlin, uh, Head of the Lord Justice Clerk's Review with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. So I intend to allow around about 40 uh, minutes uh, for this session. So I'm going to uh, open up with a general question. Uh, which is no surprise around the Specialist Sexual uh, Offences Court proposal. Uh, and we've obviously taken um, 
quite substantial evidence already this morning from the Lord Advocate and Lady Dorian uh, on this proposal. So I wonder if I can just ask, um, in view of the fact that um, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service has expressed court, uh, support for the creation uh, of a, a, a sexual offences court, I wonder if you can just outline, in your view, uh, what the main benefits uh, would be of that, but also some of the challenges that could be faced uh, as well. Let me begin, Mr D uh, Fraser, first. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service very much support the creation of this new Specialist Sexual Offences Court. Um, it gives us the opportunity, and I think you know, the committee have heard from both Lady Dorian and the Lord Advocate in terms of some of the benefits um, that this will bring. It is a, a sea change, mm -hmm. potentially, in terms of how these cases are dealt with. It has the potential to encourage um, the population to see that we take these offences as a, as a, as a, um, a Scottish people very, very um, seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also has the potential um, to create um, additional business, dare I say it, uh, through people having greater confidence in terms of the system as we currently see it. Mm -hmm. If I pull it more down to within the organisation, some of the benefits that I see is we have got very much got a two or tier system at the moment. And I think the Lord Advocate referred to that in terms of the level of resource which is given to each of the different tiers within the system. The creation of a single national specialist sexual offences court gives us the opportunity to actually create a level playing field to deal with what has become an increasing amount of cases. Um, if we look at the numbers, if we are to create the specialist court, um, it removes about 47%, I think, of the business from the High Court. It removes about 11% of the business from the Sheriff and Jury Court and actually creates a specialist court, which will deal with more business in the High Court once it is created. Um, so I think there is a, there's a lot um, of societal benefits in terms of this. I think Lady Dorian touched on it as well, that you know there are other options of things we can do. Those would be seen, I think, as tinkering around the edges. Um, I think we have done that in a number of ways in the past, and it is time for, I think, as she classified it, the clean sheet approach mm -hmm. of actually a brand new court, um, which encompasses a lot of, of new things, things that have already started since we've discussed, we, we've talked, or you know, the committee has considered the, tr the trauma-informed aspect on how that will be part, very much part of this court as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably, t t finally, from my perspective, um, this is all about a change of culture. I think, Mr Finney, you, you talked about that in terms of this being very much focused in terms of the experience of the complainer as they come through the system. Um, I think I heard the Lord Advocate say she's been in the, the, the judicial system sometimes, so have I as a, a, an administrator within the Scottish courts. Um, and I think there, we are now seeing that change in terms of the attitude and in terms of recognition by those within the system that actually having the centre of attention and focus of the experience of the complainer as they come through the system is paramount. And that certainly was the basis in which the Lady Dorian's review and how you, she conducted that review. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably a, a long answer, but very much supportive. And I think there's a lot of benefits. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about uh, what challenges I see. And I think probably um, Lady Dorian has, has already covered that in terms of how the legislation is drafted, as opposed to what her views and vision was as she made that report. So there is innuances, if you like, in terms of the legislation as it's been currently drafted, set against what she saw in her vision. Um, and I wouldn't sort of um, go over what she's already gone over the, uh, mm -hmm. before the committee this morning. Mm -hmm. th th thanks very much. I don't know if you would like to come in on that, um, Danielle McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, Convener. No, I would merely reiterate the majority, almost everything that David said, but also we've come, as David has mentioned, after Lady Dorian, who is the utmost person who can speak to the subject matter on this mm -hmm. and David and I both supported Lady Dorian in the course of the review as well and we are now as David said operational um, colleagues within the SCTS organisation as well. The, the fundamentals of this court is providing that uniformity. We've got a two-tier system. We, it will see increased case management at PH level which as Lady Dorian referenced does not happen <coughs> at Sheriff Court level. 
As David said, 11 per cent of sheriff court business currently can be categorised as sexual offence crimes. Mm -hmm. so, and that actually adds to a total of number of cases that's more th than that's in the higher court currently. So it's changing that uniformity, how these cases are managed, but most importantly, increasing the experience for complainers and for the accused and vulnerable witnesses involved in it. One of the key aspects of the court is the pre-recording of evidence. The Lord Advocate and others reference delay in the system. The purpose of pre-recording of evidence is taking that evidence earlier, significantly earlier, particularly when we are in the unfortunate environment of extended delays because of the pandemic. Commissions can take on average 16 weeks um, mm -hmm. from the start of a High Court trial. Currently, we are waiting. Um, the latest data from SCTS is that the wait from PH to trial is 49 weeks. So that's reducing a complainer's waiting time to give evidence by 36 weeks to that effect. So the key aspect is providing evidence earlier and also that allows it to be disclosed to and heard by the defence too, which in turn should help reduce the matters that are in dispute, help assist preparation of trials and reduce the length of trials and improve the efficiency of case business generally. Mm -hmm. that, that, thanks very much. That's helpful. And I suppose in the, in the spirit of consistency, because um, we did ask the Lord Advocate and um, Lady Dorian um, some questions around, I suppose, putting in place a, a, a specialist um, approach within the existing court structure I and mean, you've obviously um, articulated I think you said uh, Mr Fraser early on in your contribution that currently the system is two tier but obviously in evidence we've heard um, a, 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 an argument if you like for, for uh, the current system um, to become more specialised if you like rather than uh, go to the bother uh, so to speak of creating a, a bespoke court is there anything further that you'd like to add just on that point um, I was very much part of the group, Lady Doreen's group. I supported her mm -hmm. at the uh, discussions that it formulated her report. Um, that dimension was discussed in terms of actually um, could we create a specialism of being trauma-informed within the High Court? Could mm -hmm. we create a, spe a separate specialism within the Sheriff Court? Um, but it was felt that this would be tinkering within the current system. Um, and I think Lady Dorian has, you know, has already referred to the fact that, that what was required was an absolutely new approach mm -hmm. to how we dealt with this. Um, set against that context and background, that this is an increasing issue um, in terms of the volumes that are coming through the courts, and it needs a long-term solution in order of how mm -hmm. we will address and how we will deal with this particular type of offending. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful. OK, I'm going to open it up to members now, and I think we've got Pauline McNeill followed by Sharon Dowie. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for your insights. I know you've had a long involvement with us, and um, thank you for that. My first question is, I, I was surprised to hear you use the language of a two-tier system, and I just wondered if you'd maybe elaborate a bit more on that, because... My lines of questioning to the Lord Advocate and Lady Dorian, which I was very content with the answers, I have to say, it would still be a, there's an important distinction between the seriousness of crimes, which is why we have a high court and a lower court, which it is. Mm -hmm. and, and my understanding is that cases go to the lower court because they don't require to go to the high court. So if you mean by the two tier and a level playing field, is that is you talking about the trauma informed aspect of it? Because it would concern me if the, if the suggestion is that we wrap up all, all the crimes, which some will be more serious than others, in one court. That's not the way I would have seen it. No. Um, what this new specialist court does, in essence, is take the um, sexual offences out of the High Court, which it is, the, it is a matter for the Lord Advocate in terms of which court that... Uh, the cases will be prosecuted, and that is a decision for Crown Office in terms of what level within the system that they are prosecuted. Um, the expectation is the more serious crimes will go to the High Court and the less serious crimes will go to the Sheriff and Jury Court. But I think in terms of, of what we've already heard this morning is that there are some very complex and difficult cases that are within the Sheriff and Jury Court. Um, and, and 
what the new specialist corps actually creates is the ability for um, specialist trained people, and not just the, the, the judiciary, it's the clerks of courts, it's the prosecutors, it's the defence, looking at this um, type of offending with a very specialist lens being trauma-informed, um, and it, there being a, an element of consistency in terms of the new court um, for all uh, sexual offence cases. I don't know if I've answered your question. Uh, I, I think so. I, I think you have in relation to trauma informed. Yep. Uh, just, just so for clarity on my part, I mean there is an important distinction, and we've had this exchange before about rape cases can only go to the High mm -hmm. Court. So in a sense, we have a legislative necessity for a two-tier yep. system because of the seriousness of those crimes. And I was just worried that the suggestion is that there's something wrong with having two tiers of crimes because there are. But what I think what you're saying is, if I understood it, is that it's the specialist, yes. the level playing field you're talking yep. about is the specialist nature of the crime yep. and everything, because I won't go through it today, but the rights of audience and who prosecutes yep. is, will create to, well, in a sense, yep. Let, by necessity. I, you know I've got very yep. strong views on that, Benny. Can That's I, can why, I just, yeah, as, if I can yep. just clarify that and hopefully put your mind at rest. The creation of this court doesn't remove the need for certain cases to go through what would be the remaining High Court and other non-sexual cases to go through the remaining Sheriff and Jury. Those tiers would still remain, and quite rightly so, for the different level. Yeah. It is the, the specialism um, that this court creates. So Thank I you. think we're agreeing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so th th these are helpful figures you've given the committee. Um, the the eleven percent of business from the share of court, but forty seven percent of business, so it's quite significant. Um, I just wondered. I was wondering, what does the high court look like in those circumstances? Then, it's just a quieter court. Then, um, it, it will it will deal with. I mean, I, th I think as well. I mean, the committee is aware that. To, um, when we, we're talking about 47% of cases, that's indictments that go through the High Court. Um, sexual offence cases actually uh, translate to more trials than other types of business, so it actually comes out about 73% um, that actually proceed to trial. So, yes, the High Court will be a very different um, creature once the Sexual Offences Court has been created. Do you think, then... I mean, I've just said this to Lord Advocate, I was trying to envisage in my own mind what this court will look like. So, given we know the rise in sexual offences case, it's going to be a substantially large court. Mm -hmm. does, does that suggest that there might be a shift in resource then to the, 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 the specialist sexual offences court? And what discussions have you had with the government about the resource implications of, of their proposal? Yeah, I mean, we, we have set out in the memorandum that, that you know there, there would be costs involved for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, mainly in initial set-up costs, but there would be an ongoing running cost as well um, in, creation, in creating this um, single court. Um, the resource... Is, is very much we're not creating new business as a relation of this court. Um, the, the, what we are in essence doing is taking the existing business that's currently within the Sheriff Court and the existing business that was in the High Court, but also looking at the resources within these two different courts as well um, to create the new Specialist Sexual Offences Court. Um, so the resources in the High Court, <clears throat> uh, what would remain the High Court, it would be uh, very much reduced. Uh, with the, the, the resources that would be required for the Specialist Sexual Offences Court being actually part of that new court. I suppose it may be, uh, forgive me, I'm trying, I, I like to visualise things, okay. but it could be that the, se the Specialist Sexual Offences Court could meet in what would be Glasgow High Court, but just be called something else, and it still could be judges that would have presided in the High Court. In the, am I right in saying that? Right, OK. Um, one of the key things as well that what the new Special Sexual Defence Court um, gives us um, is it will sit in a, a vast increased number of locations that we currently sit, uh, or where the High Court oh, currently sorry, sits. Yeah. Um, so yes, the Special Sexual Offences Court is envisaged that it will sit in the key areas where that type of business is actually predominant. Um, it doesn't necessarily preclude the need um, for the Specialist Sexual Offences Court to sit beyond that in any of our locations. And again, I think Lady Dorian um, alluded to that, that we're not creating new 
a court accommodation. We are just utilising the court accommodation we've got. Right. So to answer your question, yes, you but it could, could have be a judge. Negotiable high court, but called something else. You 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 Possibly. will have the position where you have a, a, a senator who may sit as a high court judge, but they could, might will also be ticketed and be able to sit in the special sexual offences court, and they may sit in both courts. It's not a case that we'd create a system that's so inflexible. You wouldn't allow that. Um, you know, you would you would allow the flexibility to ensure that wherever the business is, that's where the resources would be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sharon Dowie, followed by John Swinney. Thank you. I think Pauline McNeill actually kind of touched on uh, some of the things I was going to co uh, cover. I was really looking at the financial memorandum for the bill and the, the costs of it, because we've heard throughout about the, the resources it's going to take to create this new court. So in the financial memorandum, table 14, um, do you think that still accurately reflects the costs that you think um, it will take to set up the court and also the recurring costs, because the recurring costs, I thought, looked quite low. Um, we've heard throughout as well, you know, it was mentioned about body-worn cameras as well, mm -hmm. and that could be taken in evidence, which obviously would put, that's another cost implication, and they still haven't been given out. So have you had any conversations with the Scottish Government um, in relation to the cost, and do you have um, an updated estimate of how much it would be? I'll, I'll start that, but I'll let Ms McLaughlin conclude that answer, if you don't mind. Um, we have most definitely had conversations with the Scottish Government. The information that we set out was on the basis of what we anticipate uh, the court will look like. It does not take account of any potential increase in the level of business um, as we go forward, if you know, as the trajectory is such that sexual offending continues to increase year upon year. Um, but is there anything you would like to add, Ms. Wall? No, I think we tried to set out in our response to the Finance Committee's um, calls for views on the financial memorandum as well. In addition to those costs, there are the invariable um, pulls and pushes of the environment we're currently in. The costs for staffing, for example, are based on our 22-23 pay deal. So inevitably, if we are continuing to or seeking to recruit 24 clerks, those costs may have a slight increase due to pay deals or changes in environment. Also, there will be changes if, for example, we are relying upon the flexibility and reorganisation and recruiting from our own internal pool of staff to gain that expertise and specialisms. But if we do have to go to the market, there are some changes in that. One of the areas probably missed out is in relation to trauma-informed practice and training. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, obviously, as part of our organisational response to our commitment to do that, we are looking at how we will roll out that training def um, across our whole organisation, and that may impact on the costs we incur associated with training the staff specifically. So we don't, to mm -hmm. cut my answer short, and apologies for the elongated response, um, we believe what's in the financial memorandum supplemented by what is in our response to the calls for views is broadly our anticipated costs. There may be some increases due to matters that are out with our control, i.e. the costs of training or the costs of staff, or another proportion of the cost is in relation to developing an IT system. And that will be dependent upon the final provisions that are in this bill, because our system will have to adapt to whatever you as parliamentary, parliamentarians approve, but also some parts of that have to be outsourced to third parties. Right. I hope okay. that answers. No, that's fine. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. John Swinney, followed by Russell Finley. Hey, thank you, Kavina. Um, I, I wonder if you have any, if you're able to share with the committee um, a, any data on the level of spare capacity within the court and tribunal infrastructure in Scotland. You know, what, what proportion, what's your utilisation level of the court infrastructure in the country? That is a very good question. Um, it is one that if you want specifics, I will have to um, come back and, and provide that information. I know that in the, the High Court, the utilisation, and it varies from court to court, because it's very much based on the, the individual court programmes that happen in all the different courts, um, and what is programmed as opposed to actually what takes place. Now, I know that within the High Court, the utilisation is very, very high. But as you come down the, the different tiers, if you like, down to the, the solemn and summary and the, the, the Justice of the Peace Court, it does vary. And I 
don't have that specific uh, figures. If you, missed if you could provide that to us it, with as much detail as possible, Mr. Fraser, because I think it's I think it's material to some of the questions around about improve, which I'll come on to, about improving the throughput of the court system and addressing some of the issues about delays that I heard with the Lord Advocate, as you may have heard earlier on. Um, and I think it also gets to the nub of whether we need to build a new infrastructure for this, which I'm profoundly sceptical about, um, given the fact that I would imagine there is spare capacity. It just might be spare capacity in the wrong place to, sort, to suit particular schedules, but okay. uh, you can give us, you, can, you, you know where I'm getting to yeah, on, can, can, on that. Oh, please do, please I do. I can Mr. give you perhaps a little bit. I mean, we have, we found within the existing estate capacity to um, run the recovery programme. Um, and that was through lots of different ways because we have now utilising a lot of the virtual and the civil side, which are least courtrooms that were then converted into criminal. So we have got the physical capacity to do more business within the court estate if that is the area that you are coming that's, from. That's what I'm getting at. Right, OK, so yes. I, so so I, I suppose what... And actually, the ground you've covered in that supplementary answer, which is very helpful, addresses some of what I'm, I, I'm keen to air as part of the evidence for the committee, that it doesn't have to be about the building of new buildings because court processes have changed dramatically as a consequence of COVID. Um, there have been changes that have taken place that people have been trying to undertake for 50 years and nobody's been interested in them. And they're now happening. They had to happen because of COVID and thankfully they've been retained. Yeah. Some of the emergency legislation that some people in this parliament complain about that we've retained in force is actually quite helpful mm -hmm. in addressing some of these challenges. So the more yeah. you can write to us about that, Mr Fraser, uh, the better. OK, can I, um, can I give... Sorry, Mr Sweeney, can I just give you one other thing that probably do. adds a little bit to that? Um, one of the areas that the new specialist sexual offences court is, is looking at taking what really good things happen in the High Court and looking at that. Um, just... You know, touching on an example, we did during the period of COVID um, introduce virtual preliminary hearings within the High Court mm -hmm. um, as one of the necessities required as a result of the pandemic. As we came out of the pandemic, we were asked actually this should be returned to a physical environment. Um, we did that, and then we found actually the practitioners and those preferred and actually saw it as a, a retrograde step, reintroducing physical, and asked us to go back to virtual, which we now do. And again, these are some of the things that we would take forward into the new special well, sexual offending court. Yeah, well, you, 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 you understand exactly where I'm coming from, so okay. I'd be keen to hear that uh, further information. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to explore, um, convener, is, is on the question that I, I was discussing with the Lord Advocate um, about delays, and I, I don't know if you were in for the, the question that I was raising with the Lord Advocate, but, you know, it strikes me that the solution to delays does not rest in the hands of one organisation. It's a, it's a joint effort between, for example, Police Scotland, the Judiciary... Sorry, Police Scotland, the Court and Tribunal Service, the Crown, mm -hmm. practitioners and the Judiciary. I suppose what I'm interested... In, is for you to share with us what steps you feel you can take to address those issues that are obviously contributing to some of the very poor experience that um, complainers are, are having mm -hmm. because processes are taking so long um, as part of that collaborative effort. OK. Um, that's a very big question for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to to um, provide an answer for that, but I'll do my very best. I mean, we are fully committed um, in order to getting our delays um, um, back and, and the amount of time it is taking for complainers and absolutely um, sympathise with the time and the difficulties that, that complainers and victims have as a result of the fact that, yes, it is taking much longer now to go through the court process than it did pre-pandemic. We are working through the recovery programme. We are programming um, everything we possibly can do. We are working over capacity uh, in terms of, of creating that ability to actually claw back the lengths of time it's taking to go through the, the court system. And we're making inroads in terms of that. Um, 
We are working collaboratively with our justice partners. I don't think there's anyone within the justice system who is not um, acutely aware of the need to actually get us back on an even keel um, as we go forward. I'm very much hoping that we will have reached that position um, one, you know, in time for the creation of, of potentially the Sexual Offences Court, because the, the more or less, I, I anticipate and hope that we will have our recovery programme all done and dusted in the time frame it will take for the introduction of the new Specialist Sexual Offences Court, and it would dovetail together, and, and that, for me, would be a wonderful achievement. And do you see progress being made in, ero in eroding the delays that yes. are taking place? Yes, I do. Is there data you can share with the committee on on that point? There is indeed, um, and we we publish we publish both projections in terms of. Um, which is, is developed in, in consultation with our Crown colleagues in terms of what we see coming into the system, how the system is behaving and then how, how long it will take us to actually recover. Uh, we also publish quarterly reports in terms of what performance, so I will make that available for the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, perhaps, sorry, apologies please, if please, it helps, please. Mr Swinney, I've got some of the data in, for, um, in front of me as well. As David says, we've, uh, we work in collaboration with COPFS and other justice partners to support the recovery programme. An updated modelling paper was produced just before Christmas. Since the start of the recovery programme, the backlog has been reduced by 16,344 cases, with 227,262 scheduled trials at the end of November 2023. The, we've gone from waiting periods of up to 63 weeks at the start of the recovery programme to, as at, December, um, as at November's waiting period, it, it reduced to 49 weeks. We are robustly reporting and working with our justice partners, and we're committed to supporting the recovery programme and continuing to re reduce that further. We're working to a new, renewed baseline of 20,000 cases following the, the, towards the end of the recovery programme as the new baseline. The one challenge we do have is that we're facing an increased volume of cases as we go forward. So the backlog is no longer a backlog per se, but it's the, um, the, what was left in the, in the, from the pandemic, but as a consequence of the new increased volume of cases as well. Hmm. I hope that that's, that's, that's very helpful indeed. And uh, uh, in that, in, in making that progress, are there, you know, are there particular areas where you think there could be further improvements that would help to accelerate that progress that's been made? I, I'll, I'll, um, we, we're moving a little bit, I think, off the Sexual Offences Court, and if I can yeah, talk more generally. Me, yeah. um, absolutely. There are other things that are happening in other parts of the system, and I would refer to the, um, the summary case yeah. uh, in terms of, of the, the very healthy um, progress that is being made in terms of the pilot courts in relation to summary business and how that is managed. Um, and that's one area where actually that has the capacity to make greater efficiencies within the system and of course summary is our, our largest volume of business that goes through the court system so that's where the, the greatest impact is going to be but some of the lessons that are learned there can equally be applied across other parts as well thank you um russell finley followed by fulton mcgregor thank you very much Camilla. good afternoon um lady dorian's review recommended the creation of the Specialist Sexual Offences Court and Scottish Court and Tribunal Service are supportive of that. And just picking up on some of the questions put by Pauline McNeill earlier on, um, your submission says that the inclusion of other crimes up to and including murder could add to much, much higher costs being borne by the, the court service. Um, Given that unpredictability, and we heard from Lady Dorian today, she still believes that crime of murder should not be in this new court. What's your position on that? And have you got any more information as to what the costs might look like in that scenario? Um, firstly, yes, I would, would absolutely support the position that Lady Dorian put forward, um, that it, it will. It was never envisaged in the model that we were looking at that that would be included within this, the Sexual Offences Court. You have to ask yourself then what becomes the purpose of the High Court, and if some of the primitive, ju primitive jurisdictions of cases that go through that are then moved into the Specialist Sexual Offences Court, such as murder. Um, so yes, I, I would. I would um, say that legislation is drafted. I would. I would follow Lady Dorian's line that yeah. she gave you this morning. 
I, I, sorry, and in terms of the financial aspect, I would ask Ms McLaughlin, is there anything you would like to add yes, in that? Mr Finlay, that was the, the main point we were trying to make with our response to that, is the extension to include more DER for all the reasons David alluded to, and also to Lady Dorian's view that, uh, uh, that Lady Dorian alluded to as well, that um, the expansion of murder creates a duplication between the High Court and it has impacts on resources as well. The, the provisions as currently drafted, of course, have the benefit of Scottish ministers having the ability to amend the list of offences. So there is obviously the potential for murder or other, some of the other cases that others may have challenges about being added in the future. But the purpose of Lady Dorian's review was the acknowledgement that we need to focus the most serious life impacting cases to the one uniformed court and use the finite resources we have in a better and more manageable way and I think that was our main concern. Yeah, I mean, the Lord Advocate referenced a particularly horrific case that took place just six months ago in, in Fife and an individual who ultimately murdered his female partner but the evidence led was a huge catalogue of violence and abuse against her and many other female partners but your position would be that should remain a high court case rather than a sexual offences court case. I, I if, there's a sexual, if there's a sexual element, um, I think that that should go into the specialist sexual offences court for the very reasons that, that you're saying is that, that this was not an isolated incident. Sure. Or, and I don't want to talk about specific cases, but no. what I've heard, there, there can be a build-up in terms of, of previous behaviour. Yeah. Um, and you know that, is, that should be in the specialist sexual offences court. And I mean, I raised that case because the Lord Advocate did so, and mm -hmm. it seems pertinent to this yeah. potential fault line. And but, but it is your view that, in a case as described, that would, even though murder is the primary charge in that case, that would find itself in the Sexual Offences Court. I beg your pardon. I'm going to backtrack. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Um, because the ultimate in that case was that the. Um, there was a deceased victim yes. as a result of that. Oh. Um, that you know, again, it, you know, in terms of the, the vision that Lady Dorian set out, that would be the case that we'd actually remain within the High Court because right. that predominantly is a, mur a murder case. Yep. And yep. the Sexual Offences Court, um, I'm going to go on a limb here, predominantly the vision was that that would be dealing with victims um, and compla sorry, complainers um, that would actually be part of that as opposed to deceased. Now, I've right. probably gone out on a limb there. Ms McLaughlin's going to correct me. <laughs> no, I think what Lady Dorian envisaged was that if that sort of case remained within the High Court, we would put and ensure that there were relevant provisions in place whereby a High Court judge who was trained in trauma-informed practice and potentially may be a, court, a judge of the Sexual Offences Court would preside over that case. The most important thing is, and apologies if we, you may interpret our initial view of don't include murder in the court, yeah. but there are these extreme yeah. examples. There are transfer powers within the bill that would allow applications to be made and decisions to be, the, the potential for that case to go into the specialist court to be discussed and determined anyway. It's uh, I mean, in which case does it not then make you ask if the ability to Im impose the trauma-informed best practice of the Sexual Offences Court to High Court murder trial, why bother with the great cost and effort of creating Sexual Offences Courts in the first place? I, I, think... if I, if I, I will... I will come back in terms of that and say that, that, that you know the whole fundamental point of doing this was looking at what happens within our system currently from the lens of those that come through the system from the complainer's perspective um, and I think you know from from my involvement in the various reviews there's most absolutely a need that what we have got currently within the um, the Scottish jurisdiction has there is room for improvement and this is one way that you can make a you know, a, a fundamental change in terms of what we do to try and make improvements on where we currently are. And we also have to look at the case volumes as well. Mr Finlay, if I may add, is that well um, just under 50% or 50% on average of indictments to the High Court equate to sexual offence cases, that then increases this year to 74% of trial courts. So 18 of our 22 trial courts are already dealing with sexual offences, whereas, as you would appreciate, therefore, a smaller proportion deal with murder. Yeah. So it, we, we very much of the views David has expressed, as Lady Dorian has expressed, we need a new 
clean sheet approach to this. And while exceptions could be made to support the exceptional cases whereby there is a combination of murder with serious sexual offences, those can be adapted. But the large proportion of cases, we need something more than that. So our strong, and you'll note our position and the response, we're strongly in support of the creation of the court. Apologies yeah. if I've gone over time. Uh, the proposed judge-only rape trials are the most contentious part of the bill, arguably. SCTS support them. SCTS support the Sexual Offences Court, the anonymity of victims, the victim legal representation, and indeed that. Um, I just wonder whether, given your role as almost like a neutral party in many respects, um, given the opposition in particular to the judge-only rape trials, whether there's any consideration given to perhaps the court service being potentially less being seen to be supportive of a government or establishment view for all these radical measures? Scottish Courts and Tribunal Services is there as an organisation to support the judiciary and deliver um, the best that we possibly can in, in running and supporting the running of the courts. From our perspective within the organisation, um, the creation of a single judge uh, or juryless um, court um, from an operational perspective is something that we can do um, and it's something that we would support for the reasons set out that at the moment there is no evidence base to determine some of the things that were talked about at the point of the review and beyond. Um, and what it does is it creates, from my perspective, it creates an opportunity um, and if you set it within the parameters of, of a time-limited pilot and not a normal pilot, so we start a pilot and it will just continue on. You do it for the purposes of gathering the information to then have the debate and then have the discussion of actually what is best in terms of going forward. Um, I think there are, there are benefits in doing that. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Fulton McGregor and then I think Pauline McNeill wants to come back in. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good afternoon now uh, to yeah. both of you. Um, I'm just going to stick to the line of questioning that uh, was um, going on in the previous two panels as well, and that's around about um, the issue of independent legal representation. I mean, your, your submission um, is different again from both Lord, uh, Lady and Dorian's and the, the Lord Advocates, and, and that you are raising uh, concerns over resource implications of this and possibility of, of delays to cases. Just wondering if you can expand on your concerns around it and um, if you think there's any any merit in the suggestions and, and how they could be achieved, if, if not through this. OK. Of course. Yeah. For the for, in the first instance, we would stress that we support, in principle, the creation of independent legal representation to support yeah. 275 applications. As a member of both of the review, um, we supported Lady Dorian through those recommendations. And just to clarify, our criticisms are just currently, and our concerns about delay and churn are a consequence of some of the way that has been presented in the bill, the procedures and practices that are suggested in the bill. That's what our main concerns are. And I can articulate them fully if that would help. Our particular concern relates to what's referred to or what we refer to in our submissions as the disclosure process, whereby a new process has been created in the bill to, to allow documentation to be given to the complainer's ILR representative. This is a from our perspective, is rather convoluted and will increase and require additional judicial resource. We'll need an, uh, the increase of uh, judicial court time, but most importantly, will act contrary to what we see was the intentions of Lady Dorian's review and also the intentions of the bill. It will build in churn and delay for complainers because a, a, an additional process to disclose information to them before the actual decision on the case could be uh, on the application could be made has been built into the process, and there are a lot of other steps that depend on the outcome of the two seven five before um, the impact a complainer. So, if we have an extra key, um, hearing that's needed before we can have the two seven five, we can't then have the ground rules hearing. You need a decision on the two seven five to allow the ground rules hearing to take place, to allow a commission to take place. So it builds in 
unintended, and I, I stress actually, apologies, I said convoluted, but it's clearly unintended delay, mm -hmm. but it's created a process that, from our perspective, and as Lady Doreen alluded to, could be much um, more simplified. It also fails to address some of the key parts of Lady Doreen's recommendations. There's a lack of clarification as to what will happen during trials. If a 275 happens during a trial, there's no certainty or no clarity in the bill as to what will happen. The inference is that we will have to stop and delay the trial for an indefinite period of time, which will inevitably cause complainers accused and all involved in the process concern and delay in the process. I think it's 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 that, Mr. Uh, Mr. McGregor. I can provide further clarity if that helps. Um, the the key point of the disclosure process, as I understand it, is to allow the complainer to have additional information to respond to the 275 application. Currently, the engagement with the complainer is done by Crown, and as I understand it, that information isn't necessarily part of the information that they need to give to the complainer to advise the court of the process. Mm -hmm and allow the court to make their decision. If I can come in, sorry, in terms of that, I, I, just to absolutely clarify as well, I mean, you know, we're supportive in terms of, of the, the uh, as, as we've stated, is we are supportive um, of independent legal representation for all the different reasons that have been talked about. It is purely down to the mechanism of how this is envisaged it would work, that as an organisation we see actually that needs to be streamlined and it needs to be revisited. And I think we're happy to work with the Scottish Government to actually look at that um, dimension if, if, if that would be of assistance. Well, well, that was my next question, because it does, does sound like you're supportive of the principle of it, but um, perhaps... Um, like Lord Advocate, you've got some concerns over how it might work in practice. So I guess that, that is my next question. How, how, how do we make it work easier? What's, what, what is the answer, if you like? <laughs> or, or if it's not as simple as that, you know, you're obviously saying you, you'd be happy to work for the Scottish Government going forward, but at this stage of scrutiny of the bill, it would be helpful for us to understand how, how, it, could, how it could work. Um, that is an excellent question, which I don't have an answer to, I'll be absolutely honest. I think what we'd need to do um, is, is go and look at what the alternative... I mean, to be honest, it, it is not for SCTS to, to really sort of um, develop the policy. And what you're asking me to do is, is develop the policy. Now, we are happy um, to give our input in terms of how we would see from an operational perspective um, a system that would introduce this, we, that would avoid the, the, some of the churn that we currently envisage, and we're, we're happy to have those discussions. I think that's probably as far as I could go. Well, I'm, not, I'm not really asking you to develop the <laughs> policy, but you've been quite clear that, um, it's, that it, as it's put out, you know, that, that you've got some issues with. So I kind of, what, what I was asking was if you had any thoughts and suggestions about how they could be rectified and how it might work, uh, how it might work better in practice. But I do accept... What I do accept we are saying just now, um, and it, it would take further discussions. But. I think maybe just to supplement David, if um, his comment says, I think the key areas, and we are open to discussion to work with justice partners on it, would be the disclosure exercise and also um, identifying some of the key aspects that Lady Dorian recommended that's not there currently, as in what's to happen in relation to trials. Is there to be what's to be dealt with? Uh, how are 275 sections, subsection 9s? to be dealt with, though there's just matters that are not addressed and there's not t some timescales that are not identified in the bill that would give the court greater certainty and would give all parties greater certainty. Mr McGregor, I I've probably gone out on a limb by uh, 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 stating those matters, but you've asked the question and those are the areas we're happy to have further discussions with Scottish Government on to allow the, a, a greater efficient process for all concerned, because that's it, we support these provisions. It's just as currently drafted, some of the mechanisms that have been put in place will unintentionally delay complainers getting their evidence taken and delay the journeys for all partners involved. Mm. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Okay. And a final question from Pauline McNeill. Thank you very much. It's just some clarity I was looking for, Daniel. Um, so, I mean, this is a huge proposal that we've got to scrutinise, so it's really important to understand what this would look like if passed into law. So I'm sure you'll tell me if you're the wrong person to answer this. But in answer to a question about uh, to, from Russell Findlay about a murder case, this is what's confusing me. So at the moment, murder can only be tried in the High Court because it's the most serious crime and attracts the highest sentence, and if it's a sexual element, will attract an even higher sentence. 
So, so this is where I need clarity. Surely there could be no change to that. But this is concerning me. If, if there's some grey area now that murder cases could go to a court which is designed for sexual offences, when, when the victim is dead, I don't understand why there's any grey area here. Could you explain? There, there's, I think the, the Lady Dorian didn't want that grey area. She wanted right. murder to remain within the High Court. And if there was a charge or element of sexual offence to it, that could be addressed properly by ensuring that the relevant court staff, the judiciary, were there. The bill and the So, there's, so, so this, there's a, a, a murder case with a sexual element that would go to the High Court. That was what Lady Dorian recommended. And that's what you use. That's, what, that's your evidence, right? Yes. Okay. I, I misunderstood what you said to Russell Findlay I, earlier. Apologies, it may have been. Because it was yeah. So that's clear. That won't that won't change. No. Okay. Thanks. But the bill does allow. The, a case with murder and se se um, sexual ailment to go to the sexual offences court. Well, that's exactly the point. As Wh why? But who, who do they need to address that question? I don't understand why that would be consistent with what this is trying to achieve. You see what I'm saying? So, so we've had evidence about. It's just c coming uh -huh. on on that, um, just to provide a wee bit of clarification. So, uh, we've just quickly looked at the policy memorandum for the bill. And if I can quote um, paragraph 282, um, it says, For the avoidance of doubt, the decision as to whether any individual case, including those involving a rape or murder, is to be prosecuted in the Sexual Offences Court will be a decision for independent prosecutors acting on behalf of the Lord Advocate. Uh, the bill right. permits rather the than requires. Point, at the moment, it's not a decision for the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Murder so is automatically tried in the High Court, mm -hmm. and no Lord Advocate and no prosecutor can take it to any other court because it is the highest court. And, and uh, my concern remains, which is if the bill, which I right, so I really I re realise my question should be direct to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice because the legislation leaves that open for a prosecutor to allow the prosecution of a murder. Am I right in saying that? The, the legislation allows for the prosecution of a murder in the Sexual Offences Court. Okay, but that's a matter for the Cabinet uh, Secretary who dropped right. OK. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks very much. OK, thank you. O on that note, we're, we're, we're running out of time. So um, can I thank both our witnesses this morning? Uh, that's been a very helpful session. And that now completes this agenda item. Uh, I thank you for attending. Uh, just to remind members that we are meeting again tomorrow at lunchtime to look at the management of transgender prisoners uh, and two related SSIs. Next week, we will return to the Victims, Witnesses and Justice Reform Bill with evidence from survivors of sexual offence cases and then from victims and survivors' organisations. Uh, I'm sure that this will be a powerful and important session uh, and I, can I pay tribute in advance uh, to those who will be attending. So thank you and we'll now move into private session. Thank you.